Silence, please. The Royal Commission is now resumed. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, this is the fifth and uh, final day of uh, this uh, public hearing 24 <coughs> on uh, education for children and young people with disability. Uh, we shall commence with the acknowledgement of country, and I invite uh, Commissioner Mason to make the acknowledgement of country. Thank you, Chair. We acknowledge the First Nations people on the land on which this Royal Commission is sitting. We pay respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngamri peoples. Their land is where the city of Canberra is now located. We also pay respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, where the city of Melbourne is now located. We pay deep respects to all elders past, present and future, and especially elders, parents, young people and children with disability. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Crozier Barlow, thank you very much for returning to continue your evidence today. I shall now ask Ms. Bennett uh, to continue the questions that she wishes to ask you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Before we begin, Dr. Crozier Barlow, I'd just like to clarify a few matters from yesterday's evidence. You told the Commission that the Chief Executive's power to direct a student to be enrolled in a particular school hadn't been used. Um, notice, under notice produced in March, South Australia indicated in response to a question about that power that a manual review of the data held by the Office of Chief Executive for the period between 2015 to 2020 was undertaken. One event was recorded during this period and that was for a student with disability. Is that the correct position? Yes. Thank you. And uh, that manual review uh, are we to take it from that that there's not a central repository of the data concerning the use of that power? The central repository is through the correspondence system and so it requires a manual examination of the correspondence system. So there's not a tag for the use of that power specifically? No. No, thank you. Uh, there was another correction that you wanted to make in relation to the review process that you described. Can you tell the commissioners what you'd like to correct about your evidence from yesterday? Yeah, absolutely. So yesterday I think you asked me about how do we make sure that special schools are engaging uh, with uh, peer aged and community in general and I said that that would be looked at through the external school review process. It can be looked at through the external school review process, but the external school review process um, involves the selection of particular areas to inquire in, and so it may not always be looked at. So it can be, not would be. Thank you. Dr. Crozabello, have you been following the evidence of the Royal Commission this week generally? Yes. Um, and have you been following the earlier hearings as they relate to education? Yes. Um, so you watched the evidence of uh, Ms. Kim Langcake and the person we've referred to as Isabella? Yes. And um, are you able to offer reflections on, on how that evidence impacted on your perspective of your role and the importance of your role? Yes. I think one of the things that I really took away from the evidence of Ms. Langcake and Isabella was the extraordinary challenge of achieving a consistently high quality experience. And that language around um, sliding doors moments and the markedly different experience between teachers and then between different settings um, really crystallised for me the significant challenge that the department has in ensuring a high quality experience in every classroom, in every school. There were also some other reflections that I had in relation to specific matters that were discussed where on the evidence that was presented, I thought that the experience of Ms. Langcake and Isabella was not consistent with our expectations and fell below our expectations as a system. And is it part of your aim to um, 
shift the system so that experiences like that aren't repeated into the future? Absolutely. And is the framework that you've provided overnight, the indicators framework for children and students with functional needs, is that a key piece of work in that transition, if I can call it that? Yes, absolutely. And did that arise out of, well, did that arise out of an independent inquiry or review? No, it arose out of the work that I initiated on entering into the role on what we call the one in four reform agenda. Uh, if you'd like, I can speak a little bit more about well, what that. prompted the one in four reform agenda. So on entering the role, I observed that we had a very wide range of ambitious reforms underway within my division, including, I think, as I mentioned yesterday, the introduction of the new inclusive education support program funding arrangement, which came into place just before I joined the department, uh, joined, joined in this role, sorry, not joined the department. Uh, and the uh, we were just finalising the rollout of one plan as the um, as the mandatory tool for planning. So there were a range of kind of big system things that were happening. My observation was that those levers were necessary but not sufficient. I think you asked me yesterday kind of what my preparation for the role was. My expertise is in thinking about how to drive system change. So how can you get a consistent change in every classroom in every school? The department in general has been on a journey in relation to this and I'm happy to talk about it. Um, in relation to the broader school improvement journey, my work on entering into the division, which crystallised into the one in four reform agenda, which you can see a summary of at attachment four in bundle D, I think, um, was about how do we take those lessons about what we know works or what we think works in improving practice and how do we apply them for students with functional needs? And so the indicator framework is one of 10 projects that were identified as really critical um, enablers of that change. We conducted, we constructed a program logic that would talk through why we thought those particular 10 projects were the 10 projects that we thought were the first ones to go after. Um, an indicator framework, and I think uh, we attached a, a short um, paper about why we're doing it. It's about providing us with a consistent base of reference for conversation about um, performance in relation to students with functional needs. And so it's a foundational piece, it's in our build foundations. But I certainly don't think that an indicator framework on its own would drive the change that is required. And, and that's why- you, I'm sorry. sorry. No. When, when do you anticipate that the, sorry, if I understand correctly, the indicator framework uh, in, includes and incorporates measurable outcomes that will indicate whether you are meeting particular domains like inclusion, family and community engagement and so on. Yes. Um, when do you expect to have all of those indicators operational, measurable? So the document that you have before you identifies those where we already have measures that we can use, so the grey yes. shaded ones. The ones that are not grey and shaded are divided roughly into two categories. There are some that will be relatively easy for us to build indicators in relation to them because we can add them to existing data collections. So there's an existing data collection, for example, in the wellbeing and engagement census. There's an existing data collection in the parent engagement um, survey. Some of them have a longer time frame. The department is working on the rollout of um, an electronic management system, EMS, or maybe it's education management system, which will provide for a consistent um, uh, student view across all students in, in the South Australian department. So some of the data that we might look to uh, extract will be more readily available once that EMS is rolled out. We're just starting that. And we did the first round last year and we're on expanding it this year, but I need to get more info if you need. I'm sorry, I'll just, say, I'll just pause you there. So I don't seek to interrogate each and every data point. I, is there a date by which you seek to have all of the indicators in the framework operational 
or have you not mm -hmm. yet been able to identify a date? No. So there are some in the medium, some in the shaded boxes are currently in place. All of those are currently in place. And there are then some that you Im imagine will be available in the medium term and some that have no fixed date at present. Is that fair? Thank you. Yeah. Um, we spoke a bit before about the, the, the witnesses who have given evidence this week. And you'll recall the evidence of Isabella and she talked about the concern that she has around starting the transition planning for her child. Um, at what stage does the department start planning transitions from school to post-school life for children with disability or functional needs? So the department has a careers strategy that outlines the department's expectations for thinking about the future for all students, including students with functional needs. Um, and it articulates that, that from the very entry into high school, um, they should begin a process of thinking about, about a child's destination. But obviously it's quite small at the beginning and it grows as, as students go through, through their high school experience. Uh, we would expect those conversations to be captured in a student's one plan. And we would expect that certainly those conversations would be happening in year 10 as you begin to translate into what in South Australia is referred to the South Australian Certificate of Education, which is the year 11 and 12 program. So year 10 is when the process should start, is that right? And you've got a document at tab 21 of your statement that is entitled Pathway to Post-School Life. That's NDIS branded, if I can put it that way. And it says in the subtext, co-design and engagement team. Can you go, I won't bring this up on screen commissioners, but could I ask Dr. Crozabalo to go to uh, page 0189 of that document, headed transition mm -hmm. programs? And if you like, the branding changes at this point and we go from NDIS branding to perhaps not NDIS yes. branding. Is this contribution to the document from South Australia? Yes. And so is this document co-authored by NDIS and South Australia together? Uh, I would need to check with the team that produced it. I, I'm not sure whether the document is co-authored, but certainly the parts that are branded South Australian are authored by South Australia. Well, the branded student pathways, is that South Australia? Yeah, sorry. I see. And um, so that's the South Australian specific element to the transition pathways, is that right? In this presentation, which yes. I understand was a presentation provided then uh, to a group of students, then yes, in this presentation. And who is that given to? Who is that distributed to? Uh, I would need to refer to my statement to, to check... Uh, which particular students this was um, given to, but I, I see from the cover that it says a session for young people in years 10 to 12 and the people who support them. But you're not sure, if, as you sit here now, whether that's rolled out consistently or if it's a one-off presentation? Uh, so my understanding is that there are offers made for those presentations across all of our special settings, so yes. Um, all of your special settings, uh, is it made across mainstream settings? Uh, I'm not aware. You don't know or is that? I don't know. don't know, okay. Is it something that should be made available across mainstream settings? Uh, it would depend, I think. So we do other pathways, um, planning and conversations with uh, children in mainstream settings. So it would depend if that was the particular um, element that they were looking for. So I think it's about a personalised response. Okay. And the non-mainstream settings you're talking about, is that the disability units? Which, which settings are those? The special classes, disability units and special schools. Okay. All right. Um, talking your evidence about um, the allied health assistance that's provided to students throughout South Australia. You talk about the Triple S assistance. Now, that, that, the Triple S practitioners are part of the group that report into you, is that right? Yes. And broadly speaking, they're allied health practitioners. 
Uh, it's a mix of allied health practitioners and specialist educators. So there's about 100 FTE of behaviour coach and special educators. And what are their qualifications? Uh, so they usually have either a qualification in special education or they have exa advanced experience in that. I see. And the Triple S group are available to assist other schools in the delivery of services across the state. Is that right? They're available to assist government schools. Yes. Yes. And uh, are they? Where are they located? Those hundred FTE. Oh, sorry. There's uh, about four hundred and eighty FTE. Hundred is the educators. Um, so we have 15 regional offices um, and most of the FTE are, allocated, are, are located in those 15 regional offices. We also have a small number of small statewide teams. So we have a, um, a Swiss team which provide emergency response, uh, postvention um, kinds of responses. We have a EALD team who coordinate ELD. We have a children in care team. They are not located necessarily in the 15 regional offices, but most of most of them are. So there are um, offices located in regional areas? Yes. Absolutely. And remote areas? Uh, not in remote areas, no. Okay. How, how's the access for remote areas to these services managed? Depending on what you mean by remote areas. So uh, for example, on the APY lands, which is um, probably the most significantly remote area in South Australia, we have a fly-in, fly-out presence, um, but we also provide intensive support to the education staff on site. Um, uh, so it, it sort of depends on what you mean. Well, taking that example, you've got a fly-in, fly-out presence. Does that mean the Triple S fly-in and fly-out on demand, or do they do that proactively? Uh, I would need to check. Okay. And is the document at tab nine, that's the document that identifies and outlines that the model of delivery by those triple S officers? That's the overall service model. If you're looking to understand the actual specific services that are offered, um, the better document is at 23, which provides the catalogue of services. So that's yes. the forward facing document that schools would look at in determining how to seek advice and support. Thank you. You heard Commissioner Galbally talk about, I think, flying squads and ZAP units, I think are the two phrases that have been used. Uh, is that something that's contemplated in the structure? Rapid responses to crisis might be another way of phrasing it. So we have two existing teams that, that, um, that can perform that function it sort of depends for what purpose so as I say we've got a Swiss team which is a social work intervention support service uh, and they they might provide intensive support in relation to uh, mental health in particular following an incident on site um, so they are a fly and fly out kind of zap squad in that context we have recently established a self-regulation team um, which is a really interesting model that we're trialling to see the impact of. They're about um, providing intensive proactive support to schools who have identified that they have a real challenge with um, supporting children to co-regulate and then self-regulate as they, they get a bit more capable of that. In addition, and I have been thinking about Commissioner Galbally's suggestion because I think there's some real there's something really interesting in it. One of the things that we offer out of our IESP team is that when a school is really struggling to identify and implement adjustments for learning, we will often um, have a senior member of the IESP team go and sit down with the school leadership and support the school leadership in thinking about how are you planning out your waves of intervention if we're using the RTI language. So how, what are your universal interventions? What are your targeted interventions? How are you doing that? And what upskilling would you need to provide to your teachers to support that? And then what external assistance might you want to access from student support services in support of that? Now we do that in a largely reactive way. We do do it in response to what I would refer to as cries for help. So schools saying, 
Um, often it comes with a request, a very urgent request for funding for a particular child. And we will sort of suggest that perhaps the, the complex behaviour being exhibited by this particular child might suggest that there's a need to think through the broader structures in place in the school. And so we'll sit down and support the school to do their planning in that way. I think there's an opportunity to be more proactive about that and we're um, actually just about to launch on a pilot of that with relation to preschools um, who are also serviced by my, by my team. Is that? Sort and of what and you want? ISP. Who's ISP? ISP? I'm sorry, we're getting sorry. feedback at this end. Oh. That sorry. seems to have resolved. Thank you. Um, what does ISP stand for? The Inclusive Education Support Program. It's the funding program. Thank you. And um, is information about that service provided behind tab 23 of your statement? I No, because that IESP um, team sits in a different part of the division. And so how are schools told about the existence of that team? Uh, they are told about the existence of that team when they apply for funding. So, okay. uh, And perhaps if they're watching today? Uh, uh, they all know about the IESP team, but yes, if they're watching today, they will also have another reminder about it. So how do they know about the, all know about the ISP team? Because every school applies for funding. I see. So they know about the existence of this capacity to provide that intensive support. Yes, so it's referenced, it's, it's referenced in the application. Yeah, uh, in the covering information in relation to the application. Yeah. I see. Um, Broadly speaking, the Triple S service is there to upskill schools and provides limited therapeutic intervention for children one to one. Is that fair? It depends on which um, discipline you're talking about. Uh, so I, I would find it hard to generalise in that way. For example, in social work, really the work that they are doing is in relation to students and is much less in relation to schools. Yes. Um, for behaviour coaches and special educators, absolutely much more. The focus is um, upskilling educators um, and, and leaders. So it depends on the discipline, but it's not an unfair characterisation. It's just, it, it's a bit discipline specific. Yeah, so speech pathologists, for example, when there's a need for assistance with communication, and you've heard the evidence of uh, Mr Percival, no doubt, about his view about the importance of communication. Is that a view you share? Of course. Y you would agree that communication is the starting point for students engaging yes. in education? Absolutely. Um, and so where is the, is the school environment providing access to those sorts of speech pathology services one-to-one -one, or does that come elsewhere? Uh, so I think as you heard from Mr Percival's evidence yesterday, it is somewhat of a complicated landscape and depends a little bit on what services a child is accessing outside um, via NDIS. And I think that's referenced in the catalogue of service. It talks about the role of the speech pathologist in um, considering and navigating external service providers. In general, um, as described in the uh, in the catalogue of services, we do provide some intensive one-on-one -on -one therapeutic support for particular priority one cases in relation to speech pathology from student support services. But that largely um, the focus of the work is around upskilling teachers as well to be able to provide that support ongoing. In addition, schools will engage speech pathologists by what we call commissioned services or school buy-in of services. Yes. And those speech pathologists will undertake a range of duties, sometimes individual intensive therapeutic duties and sometimes, again, a more um, capacity building duty and often small group work is a particular um, area for the school buy-in speech pathologists. So a school can elect to buy in some speech pathology assistance for small mm -hmm. group work or to upskill teachers in communication, is that right? Yes, and I believe they can also elect to buy it in for individual therapeutic interventions. Yeah. Right, so, um, and that buy-in comes from their general school budget? Uh, 
I assume that it comes from their, what we call their tier two allocations, which are the allocations provided to schools for, um, uh, for a range of different student cohorts, including, for example, if you're in a low SES school, you get top up funding, the IESP grant that I referred to yesterday, um, there's some complexity funding that comes through. There's a range of different tier two uh, funding sources that schools might use to do that. They might also aggregate individualised IESP funding to um, purchase a speech pathologist. So continuing with the speech pathologist example, the school could use its generalised bucket of funding, which includes additional funding for some complex needs within the overall community. Mm -hmm. Or if there's a particular student, they could buy in speech pathology support for that particular student from an individual allocation. Is that a fair summary? Yes, they could. Thank you. And um, is the position any different for an NDIS participant? So I understand um, from our catalogue of service that the position is somewhat different from an NDIS participant because if an NDIS participant has an external provider, then there is a need to, um, to work out kind of who is doing what in what ways and that's referred to in the, um, in the catalogue of service, the function of the speech pathology service in navigating that is referred to. Um, so if there is an external provider already working with the child who is NDIS funded, is the mm -hmm. child more or less likely to get that support brought into the school? I do not know. Okay. And um, if a child is not an NDIS um, participant but is self-funding speech pathology services, can they bring that allied health person into the school? That's a different Question. Yes, it is a different question. Yeah, so the department doesn't distinguish between NDIS or self-funded allied health providers when it's considering access of external providers to school. Okay, so leave aside whether, who's, who's funding the external support. Can somebody who's been working with a speech pathologist since they were three in their home environment bring that person into their primary school environment when they're five and do speech pathology assistance there? So I can refer you to the department's policy on this, but the short answer on it is that it's a matter for the principal to decide. Is it a case-by-case -case basis like we heard from Mr Percival? It should be a case-by-case -case basis. And if schools are saying a blanket no, would that be inconsistent with your policies? Yes, it is inconsistent with our policies. So if the school website, for example, said we just don't accept that, that yes. would be something of concern? Yes, and I believe in the hearing bundle you have identified for us a school website that does do that. And my team has reached out to that school to talk about changing the language on the website. And how, so what's the process for identifying whether the schools are complying with this other than the Royal Commission? Uh, so we don't conduct routine audits of that matter. And is that, so do you have any way of knowing whether there might be other schools who are telling parents that they can't bring allied health into the school? We hear feedback from parents about that and, um, and when that comes to us, then we follow up with the schools to understand their decision-making process. And is there a process that doesn't depend upon the parents to do that? No. Okay. Is that something that um, might need to be looked at? There is a constant challenge in systems like education in thinking about how tightly do you audit um, every single policy at every single moment versus how much do you do a sampling audit. So I think there is an opportunity to do a sample audit in relation to this. Do I think it would be a good use of the department's time to conduct an annual review of this particular process? I'm not convinced that that would be the most effective use. I would prefer to spend the time working with schools, talking to them about um, how to better provide supports and services. So I think it's a balance, but I do think there's an opportunity to include in our audit process. Is talking to families about the way that you can improve the processes as something else that you think would be a good use of time? I think that's a much better use of time. And I think that that's been something that I also reflected on um, listening to the 
testimony this week and then thinking about your questions yesterday. I and do think that, that yes. Is that something that, sorry to interrupt you, um, is that something that you've had the opportunity to do so far in your role? Speak to families? Hmm. Yes. It, it, at the times you spoke yesterday about the, the visiting various sites, have you spoken to the families at those sites? The families weren't present when I, when I visited the sites. No. So it's just the students in class? Yeah. And so have you had the opportunity to speak to families um, in, this, in what environment have you had the opportunity to speak to the families? So as I said to you yesterday, I had extensive opportunities to talk to families of students with disability in my previous role in the Year 7 high school role. And in this role, I haven't had any formal opportunities to speak to families with um, uh, because the various forums where I might have had those opportunities have not been face-to-face -face forums. Commissioner Mason might have a question around it. Um, just had a question. Have you had a chance of speaking with families on the APY lands? No, I haven't. Okay. Is that in your agenda for the next little while? Uh, so uh, it can be. I think one of the um, one of the questions for us is to think about where the decisions are being made and who the right people to engage is. I'm really conscious of not kind of just walking around and engaging with communities without a purpose on that engagement. Um, so we have a formal um, structure in relation to the APY lands. It's called PYEC. It's a, a formal structure for engaging with families and communities in relation to the APY lands. So if I was in the APY lands, of course, I would want to talk to families while I was there, but I would want to have a purpose for that engagement. And of course, the members of the PYSE are also family members of they children are. on the on the lands as well. They really are. Yeah. Um, the um, identification of the kinds of adjustments uh, that might be supported by the school and might be supported by NDIS is an area that where some confusion can arise. Is that fair? Uh, some confusion for who? For families and for... Well, for, well for, for you, for the state. Can there be, is there any confusion at times about what the obligation is for the state to fund supports as against the NDIS? Uh, so the state's obligations are reasonably clear. We're required to fund adjustments um, to support the inclusion in school. Um, so we will do that. The, the question... Uh, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. So that's not something that is on that obligation. So that's not that's not something about the identification of where the line is between a reasonable adjustment and a support provided by the NDIS hasn't caused South Australia any concern. I am aware that families find it really clunky that we might be able to fund an adjustment in school. Um, that doesn't translate to the home environment and that the NDIS might fund an adjustment in the home environment that doesn't translate to school. So I am aware of that clunkiness. I wouldn't want to suggest that South Australia is not aware or clear about its obligations in relation to funding adjustments for all students, NDIS funded or not, to ensure that they can access their education. I think you tell us it, it's at tab 14 of your statement, there's a which is the non-education service providers procedure, you tell us, well, the state tells us, that all reasonable adjustments provided in the preschool or school to ensure a young person or child can access their education must be provided at the expense of the preschool, preschool or school. Skipping a few lines, you say, examples of reasonable adjustments can include, but are not limited to, curriculum adjustments, strategies included in learning plans, behaviour plans, but do not include therapy. So what, what is it that is therapy there? That is, does that include speech therapy or speech pathology? Uh, that is a challenging question. So I can see how that, that particular question arises. I would refer you to our um, student support services catalogue of service to describe the kind of therapy that we would provide. And so there's a kind of therapy that you do provide as a reasonable adjustment? Yes. Um, and so it's not universally NDIS only. 
Yes. And so there, there can be some areas of grey around those issues. Yeah. And do you have a communication process with the NDIS around how those issues are resolved? I understand we have operational communication arrangements with the NDIS, but I'm not familiar with the contents of what we what we talked to them about. Who's responsible for raising issues of concern around where the funding is coming from with the NDIS? So it would uh, it would relate to the particular uh, instance. Would, would hmm. if a, if a school said we can't fund that, the NDIS should fund it. Oh. The parent said, I don't think that's right. Whose responsibility is it to resolve that issue? So the school should seek advice from the Director of Inclusive Teaching and Learning. And if that needs to be escalated to the NDIS, who has responsibility for doing that? The Director of Inclusive Teaching and Learning. And where does that person report to you? Yes. Thank you. Um, I wanted to, fi finally, I want to ask you about uh, the transfer from a special school setting to a, um, a mainstream setting, is that something that can happen at the election of a parent at any time? Yes. And so in your, in your policies, you tell us in the document we discussed yesterday with the chair at D24, at page 276, it refers to the transfer of a student from a special setting to a mainstream setting. Mm -hmm. And it says, it says there at 5.1, the student may exit a special option for a number of reasons. Skipping a few words, in these instances, the parent, school staff, special educator and psychologist may meet to review the student's one plan or like document. Do you see that at the end of 5.1? I do. And so that's the psychologist, that's the departmental psychologist we've spoken about? Yes. And so that's not the person with a therapeutic relationship with the child? No. Um, would the departmental psychologist have necessarily met the child? Uh, so in this, it's worth saying this document is an internal guide for my division um, and so it's written from the lens of the practitioners within my division it's not a, a formal procedural policy um, i am expecting that when they write this but i can confirm with it that they mean the psychologist who made the assessment of the child i see the best place so to make so the reason why the psychologist is involved is that they're the one who make the assessment in relation to eligibility and suitability. So the person who's made the assessment is the person who makes the decisions that follow from that assessment. Is that right? Uh, so this doesn't talk about a decision. No, no. Uh, the chair spoke with you yesterday about recommendations made by the departmental psychologist. Yeah. In each instance, the departmental psychologist has met with and examined and assessed the child. But they're making uh, the recommendation. Uh, yeah. A departmental psychologist or a, yes. or a psychologist procured through our external provider panel when we are unable to provide service in sufficient time. And perhaps I just, the departmental psychologist who makes the recommendation as to suitability and eligibility has always met the child, is that right? Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, it goes on to say at 5.2, the special option recommendation changes following a review by, the, by a psychologist. Um, and then it go, e.g. special class to disability unit or disability unit to special class. A new document is signed, information is collated into a student package. The local office must decide on whether the student pocket package must be lodged, etc. Mm -hmm. Does there need to be a recommendation for the transfer before the transfer to a mainstream setting is effected? No, I do not understand that there does. A, a, a parent can enrol their ch seek to enrol their child or seek to transfer their child without a recommendation from student support services. I see. So the reference this there to if the if the special option recommendation changes following a review, that's not a necessary precondition to the change. It's just one option for the change. Is that right? Yes. And so the parent can at any time decide they'd like to now go into a mainstream setting. Yes. 
Are there any barriers to that happening? Are there any assessments that take place in the mainstream setting? Does the principal need to agree? No. no. Um, Chair, those were the matters, and I'd like it noted three minutes ahead of what I promised. Yes, but you've got a few more minutes to make up. Um, all right, should we take a break now? Uh, uh, unless there are questions from the commissioners. All right, well, let's take questions from the commissioners and then we'll have our break. First, uh, Commissioner Gelber. Thank you for your evidence. Um, just picking up that last point, so the inquiry into suspension, exclusion and expulsion processes in South Australia that was completed recently, um, so principals can't exclude that if a parent says they want their child to go to a mainstream class, the parent, the principal can't say no. Is that what you're saying? So acceptance of enrolment is subject to the enrolment procedure and a principal cannot deny um, enrolment on the basis of disability. It's, it's part of the um, requirements under the Disability Standards for Education. So, so this report, which um, what what's the status of it and what's happening with it? So Professor Graham undertook that report um, in 2019 or 2020 from memory mm -hmm. and made a series of recommendations. The um, former minister made a public statement in response, which included committing $15 million dollars in additional funding over four years to implement uh, some but not all of the recommendations of Professor Graham's report. The best summary of that is available if you look at the document at page, uh, document four, on the back of that kind of one pager, um, or document three, sorry, and the back of that, uh, mm -hmm. that kind of simple summary of the support and inclusion work. You'll see there are two halves of the work. So there's the one in four agenda, which I spoke about earlier, which is our promotion of um, learning in mainstream settings for students and mm -hmm. On the right hand side is the behaviour and engagement reform. Now, most of the projects articulated in that are projects that are a part of the government's response to Professor Graham's review. Right. Um, I'd love to see the more the details of that, if that's possible. Yeah. And um, when you said the indicator framework on its own won't drive change, um, and you referred to ten other, I don't, without going into the detail, what are the other factors that would drive change? So the way our kind of theory of change involves. One, being very clear about what good practice looks like, and I think the Commission has heard that in a number of different ways. And so we're building a range of universally available, um, on-demand, good practice guides for mainstream teachers in particular in thinking about how to provide appropriate adjustments for students with functional needs. They're called practice guides. Um, there's uh, then there's the second thing, which is around the supports. So what supports are you wrapping around schools to make sure that they're um, planning uh, and that their interventions are effective? You mentioned yesterday your interest in the Autism Lead Teacher Initiative, which is um, something that the new government has committed to. So every primary school will have uh, a teacher with 0.1 or 0.2 FTE. Um, allocated to spend time first upskilling in understanding teaching students with autism and then time in supporting improvements in practice in their classroom. I am really interested in the effectiveness of this as a model. So the challenge that we face as a department is scale. So it's you can get five schools doing great, you can get 20 schools doing great. Once you're trying to get 500, there's a real question for us. So I think there's something quite interesting in this Autism Lead Teacher Initiative, which we will be tracking to see what is the impact. And particularly we're looking to track to see if it impacts on the rates of exclusionary discipline for ARDA 2. So one of the findings of Professor Graham's review was that we are increasingly excluding children in this ARDA 2 and Almost always, those are a function either of the communication 
concerns that we've discussed uh, previously in the Commission or in relation to issues around self-regulation. Um, uh, and so we are interested to see if the professional um, development of teachers in primary schools in relation to strategies that work for kids with autism will actually lead to improvements in practice and capability that benefit all children and in particular that group of children that we're excluding in ARDA 2. So that, that supports, there are other things that we're doing in relation to supports, um, you know, obviously putting in extra resources in student support services and mental health. I think for me, if you think systemically, it's universal, universal good practice of information. It's targeted supports and using data to the point that you've made a number of times, Commissioner, using data to identify where the support is required. And so we're building our the indicator framework is a really important part of that so that then you can go and target the schools that need the extra support. Um, so providing extra support and then building the capability of individual teachers and leaders because that's ultimately what will make the biggest difference. And so my last question is um, about the wall between um, segregation and inclusion and your committee, you sort of said you could do sample audits um, to check whether that wall's coming down and whether there is much more interaction and even transition. Is, yes. is that, am I correct? Thank you. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Mays. Yes, um, thank you also for your evidence. Um, I just had a question about the uh, work done by Professor Graham and content around First Nations students. Um, and I understand there's, there is a bit of information there in that document. Um, and also interested in how that has informed the indicators framework because um, just looking at it, uh, the non-shaded areas are very ambitious and thinking about the settings where First Nations students with disability are in South Australia in metro and regional and remote areas. Just your feedback on that. So Commissioner Laurie, has, um, who's the Aboriginal Commission, Chief Commissioner for Aboriginal Children and Young People, has been providing very effective advocacy in this space. Um, and uh, so the document that you have at tab three, there is an updated version that has emerged <laughs> subsequent to this and incorporates some of the election commitments. And it includes specific reference to the work that we're doing to ensure that all of the reform initiatives we're undertaking are um, undertaken with a lens of considering um, culturally uh, responsive practice, um, but also thinking through how we work with families and communities. So we've got some specific project leads, some specific um, Aboriginal advisors who are working across the whole reform program um, uh, to help us do that. I think um, there's the Professor Graham's report indicated what what I think is is um, is probably completely unsurprising to you that uh, students with a disability are overrepresented in our exclusions. Aboriginal students are overrepresented in our exclusions. Children in care are overrepresented in our exclusions, and kids with all three are really overrepresented in our exclusions. Um, and I think uh, that provides us with a really um, pointy uh, uh, marker about where we need to be focusing our efforts. Thank you very much. And I wish you um, all the best in your role. Thank Thanks. you. Did uh, Professor Graham address the role of uh, departmental psychologists in uh, assessing and determining recommendations for the placement of children with disability? No, her review was about um, ex uh, exclusionary discipline, so it wasn't, uh, wasn't looking at special uh, settings. Oh, so it was confined to exclusionary discipline. <clears throat> All right. In that case, thank you very much <coughs> for your uh, evidence and for the assistance you have provided, including your written statement. Uh, we appreciate uh, your uh, being able to come to the Royal Commission virtually. 
instead of coming in person, and as uh, I'm sure you wanted to do, but uh, we do thank you very much for your assistance. Thank you. I'll just check before we finish, uh, just to make sure, uh, Mr. Si if Mr. Simpson is online, who represents, oh, there you are. I am present, thank you, Chair. You have um, no, no questions? No questions, thank you, Chair. All right, thank you very much. In that case, again, thank you very much, and uh, should we now... Until 11.15, but please, Chair. <clears throat> take an adjournment until 11.15. Yes, thank you. We'll adjourn now, resume at 11.15. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. Commission is now resumed. Yes, Ms. Eastman. Um, thank you, Commissioners. Our next witnesses uh, you'll see on the screen Katie Coolis and Alexa, which is a pseudonym. And, Commissioners, you'll recall Katie Coolis participated in Public Hearing 17.2, our Hobart hearing. And you'll remember that uh, Katie represents the Yellow Ladybugs. Yellow Ladybugs is an autistic-led non-government organisation with strong bridges to the community. And the Yellow Ladybugs are dedicated to the happiness, success and celebration of autistic girls and women. The Yellow Ladybugs has been running the ADHD and Autistic Minds Conference over the past two days. So we are very grateful that they, after uh, a number of, or three days conference, I think, um, to be able to join us this morning. Commissioners, we've put up a content warning and the evidence that you're going to hear this morning from Katie and Alexa may be confronting and distressing for some people. They have given their affirmations and the way in which we're going to conduct this part of the evidence is I will hand over to Katie, who's prepared a presentation that she'd like to read. Then we'll turn to Alexa. Then we have a short video that the Yellow Ladybugs would like to share with the Royal Commission with some concluding comments, which I'll you will see when we get to that and then to the commissioners if they've got any questions so that's the proposal so katie a very just, just warm welcome we start, can do I, you want to yes can i thank you very much uh, katie for coming back to the royal commission to give evidence again uh, we very much appreciate your doing that as you did i think in public hearing 17 and alexa thank you too for coming today and for giving evidence and we look forward to hearing what you have to uh, tell us. So thanks again. And uh, I'll now hand uh, over to uh, Katie, uh, as Ms Eastman indicated. Thanks. And just, uh, we've pointed out that Commissioner Galbally is also on the screen oh, I'm as sorry, well, yes. and that, that, that there's two commissioners here in the hearing yes. room in Canberra. Yes, Commissioner Galbally is joining the hearing from Melbourne. You can see her on the screen. And of course, Commissioner Mason is with me in the in Canberra here as well. Right. So Katie, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, and thank you, Commissioners. I have pre previously introduced Yellow Ladybugs and our mission, so I'm going to jump straight into the evidence for today's hearing. So on behalf of Yellow Ladybugs, we are drawing on the schooling experiences of our extensive community of autistic girls and gender diverse students and parents and carers. And Yellow Ladybugs considers that a high level, we continue to fail this community across Australia in their education. Autistic girls and gender diverse individuals are often particularly disadvantaged due to their more internalised autistic presentation, whereby they mask well and appear to be coping. Their disability and their specific needs are often hidden, which serves as a further barrier to accessing the supports they are absolutely entitled to at school. No doubt you've heard from many people throughout this hearing of extreme injustices throughout your week. 
and extreme examples of failing autistic students. And whilst these stories are imperative, we want to share a different perspective about the everyday injustice of being overlooked, the trauma that comes from having invisible needs and not being disruptive enough to get support. In these common situations that cause long-term trauma, which takes decades to unpack. And I am angry. I'm determined to change things, especially as you said, Kate, three days of listening to 40 neurodivergent people share their stories at our conference. And do you know what the common theme was? Trauma. One after the other, we heard from brave autistic women and gender diverse pe people share their experiences growing up in a school system that favoured the neuro majority. That was designed and set up to change who we are naturally. They shared their experiences of being doubly marginalised as growing up or socialised as girls, often overlooked because we are just less disruptive, but we're holding so much under the surface that came at a cost later years tenfold. But what else did I hear? I heard that when we know better, we do better. There were parents, teachers, even autistic individuals there crying out of guilt. And I said, no, don't cry. Let's not be guilty about, about what we may have done wrong in the past. Let's only cry if we still do it knowing better. So yes, I'm angry, but I'm also hopeful. I felt the collective energy in the room and I sensed an uprising. We won't be overlooked anymore. We won't be forgotten. We will not accept any types of neuroconversion therapy. The ABA or social programs designed to make us less autistic and more neurotypical. Why should we, why should we stand for this? any more than our gay community should, who were subjected to gay conversion therapy so many years ago. We are saying no more. I know there's a groundswell growing. We are changing things from the bottom up. We are coming together and saying enough is enough. Things have to get better. And like any other movement on inclusivity and acceptance, we need to make the neurodiversity movement understood on a curriculum level. When students are young, we need them to understand and celebrate different brains, just like any other difference they learn about at school. We need to make unique the norm. And we need to teach the teachers this. So they understand it before they even step foot in a classroom. And it needs to be neurodivergent led and informed and consistent across all of Australia. I fear I'm wasting my breath though, because we talk and we talk and we share and we explain, but what will actually be done? What will change in a system that is already overloaded? But I am going to keep going for the, for the autistic girl is sitting in the playground with only a tree as her friend. And for the autistic teenager who is in detention every week and on a behaviour management plan when they really should be on a connection plan. Like in my children's case, for the autistic girls who don't get the support they need in mainstream school, don't get access to a specialist school, have to go to a Catholic school when they're not even religious to get support. And even that fails them and then ending up at a community school, which does, not, which does support them on some levels, but puts them in a very vulnerable position. I will always keep fighting. And at Yellow Ladybugs, we will always keep re representing a community that's been ignored for generations. And we will be breaking this to toxic cycle. And through our regular communication with our community, we are aware of many cases where individual educators and education providers continue to fail to understand, apply and comply with the rights, obligations and measures for, for our students in a, every region of Australia. And on some level, all of these cover off forms of neglect, abuse and exploitation. So that's my introduction. 
I do now want to go into some specifics with you today on some of the issues that we have found throughout our community and it is formed through our extensive reach in every corner of Australia and through a survey we conducted where we did have 1,500 responses on education. So the first thing I want to introduce is enrolment. Many schools continue to engage in active gatekeeping to prevent autistic students from enrolling in their school. This practice is often subtle. For example, the school offers claiming they are unable to schedule a meeting with the principal because they're fully booked for the next month or they don't have places when you say that your child is autistic. This is happening and it needs to stop. Student supports and adjustments. Many schools continue to claim that there is no funding. For example, in Program for Students with Disability in Victoria, they are not able to provide any additional supports for autistic students, including things like education plans, student support group meetings, and particularly for our community, autistic girls miss out on these fundamental supports because they are not seen as disruptive enough to warrant them. This is a consistent message, as I said, across all regions of Australia. All autistic girls and gender diverse individuals, whether they have funding or not, need access to additional supports. Schools need to be providing families and autistic students with more consistent information about what adjustments they should be able to have and what their legal rights are. So from our survey, we found 34% of respondents felt their daughter needed access to an aid but were in, ineligible due to funding requirements. And one quote said, my daughter has strong language skills so missed out on funding. She just didn't get funding because she is not outwardly disruptive to other students but she is imploding internally, not performing to her potential and I'm concerned on the impact this will have in her teen years and adult life. Many school teachers still refuse to make accommodations, modifications or reasonable adjustments to the curriculum or to meet the sensory needs of autistic students on the basis that it's not fair to other students. Schools are minimalizing the extent of need, concerns are often dismissed and there is a lack of preventative support. I want you now bring up behaviour management, discipline, and the CPS model. This is a very big topic for our community. Behaviour management and managing behaviour is not trauma-informed. We want to draw your attention, attention to the work of New South Wales-based disability advocate, Louise Kush, who is working with Ross Green to bring the CPS model, Collaborative Proactive Support, was what it stands for, to Australia to replace the currently implemented PBIS model, which stands for Positive Behavioural Interventions and Supports, which is Australia-wide. And we do want to note that this does stem from ABA. We strongly endorse Lou's request that it is time to move beyond, beyond the harmful and outdated principles of behaviourism and towards neurodiversity-affirming teaching practices and classroom behaviour support. This would bring students and families improved access to learning and a sense of safety and belonging. The emphasis of the CPS model isn't on kids challenging behaviour, just the manner in which they're expressing the fact that there are expectations that they have difficulty meeting. In the CPS model, the goal is to foster problem solving collaborative partnerships between adults and children and to engage them. It's non-punitive and non-adversarial. It decreases the likelihood of conflict, enhances relationships, improves communication, and helps children and adults learn and display these skills on a more positive side of human nature. It's empathetic and it appreciates how one behaviour is affecting others, resolving disagreements in ways that do not involve conflict. So at the conference, we heard this amazing quote, you wouldn't consequence a student who was asthmatic, who needed to take Ventolin. So there shouldn't be penalties for autistic students needing regulation time. And that was Rhiannon Lowry who spoke. 
And another quote from one of our speakers, Francis Brennan, said, as an autistic health professional, I often think back to my teen years. It's not only the supports I wish I had received, but those supports I wish I hadn't. The damage caused by the implementation of behaviour management plans and contracts should not be underestimated. At a time when I needed adults to help me understand a world I was struggling to navigate, I was given a contract to sign, stating I would behave appropriately in class. As if my emotional response to my struggles were some commodity to be traded and signed away. My difficulties regulating were treated as a choice rather than an expression of my struggles. While staff were develop developing a plan of how my behaviour should be managed, I was sitting in a classroom wishing I didn't exist, wondering if the world would be better if I didn't exist. A behaviour management plan focuses on symptoms of an underlying struggle. We owe it to our young people to spend time with them and help them develop skills to succeed, not simply manage the expression of their struggles. We owe it to our students to see them as people, not just as behaviours they display. And I thank Francis for that beautiful quote. But we've heard hundreds, and it's not an unremarkable story from a community being subject to disciplinary measures, being punished due to their disability in direct contravention of human rights legislation. We've heard specifically at Yellow Ladybugs of autistic students being kept in at lunchtime to finish work when no effort was made by the school teacher to modify or support or give reasonable adjustments, adjustments to meet their challenges. Autistic students being suspended or put on reduced hours for behavioural reasons when underlying causes of their behaviour is their disability and failure of the system to meet their needs. Schools using the IEP process inappropriately to place behavioural expectations on autistic students and failing to engage the autistic student. It just doesn't stop. It's endless. So we call on an action for that, and that is one of our recommendations. The next thing I think I want to introduce, and it's really important for our autistic girls and gender diverse individuals who do have a more internalised presentation, is participation and restricted access to education. So I want you to think about every student has a right to an education. But many autistic students continue to be the victim of exclusion practices, including subtle exclusions that greatly undermine their right to participate fully in all aspects of their schooling. Examples include autistic students being told that they can opt out of extracurricular activities such as school concerts, grade six graduation ceremonies, when no actual effort has been undertaken to genuinely include or accommodate these students in the activity. Autistic students not being allowed to attend excursions or camps unless their parent accompanies or they learn to pack up when that's an executive functioning struggle. From our, 2000, from our survey, 18% of parents have been able to access education for their daughter due to suspension, exclusion or being sent home. 39% have had to change schools due to their daughter not having their needs met. One quote was, my daughter is only attending school for half days. This comes after a term of multiple calls each week to pick her up due to distress, absconding, so we are getting these phone calls daily and it is making a big difference to their access to education. So I'm going to change gears now and I'm going to talk about bullying. And we know this is an issue for, for many, many children. But school bullying policies often fail to meet the specific needs of autistic students who statistically are higher and likely to experience bullying at school. From our survey, 71% of students had received bullying in some form. 
48% were verbally abused, 20% physically, 52% have been socially excluded. So particularly for autistic girls and gender diverse individuals, we want you to be aware of the different types of bullying. It can be less obvious for this cohort and often takes a more covert form, hidden, out of sight actions, including making up stories to get someone in trouble, spreading rumours, being ignored. Autistic girls and teens have a higher risk of exploitation from peers, making them more vulnerable to manipulation. Not understanding their peers' motives and intentions of others. And I spoke about this at the previous Royal Commission and the link to mental health and the risk of violence and abuse. Because what this does is it leads many of us to masking or hiding who we are. And this has a massive impact on our mental health. And as I explained earlier, the toll it takes decades to unpack. How can we change this? Well, firstly, we need to positively, actively promote inclusive attitudes towards neurodivergence through a whole school approach that actively involves students, staff and parents and the neurodivergent voice. We need teachers to understand how much internalisation occurs for us Sometimes she may not be able to articulate how she is feeling. So it may be seen that she's coping when she's literally not. She may be good at internalising her emotions, but we need teachers to check in more regularly, especially if there is a change in her usual behaviour. And at the conference, we heard about two really good things. We heard around DBT skills that is very good for autistic individuals and we heard about interception. And I know the, the government, the Department of Education in South Australia has done a lot of work on this. And we encourage all departments across Australia to look at these two areas that will help not only autistic girls, all students. Many schools adopt the restorative practice approach to bullying, where perhaps she's been involved in an incident and then needs to discuss this with her bullies and needs to express or share her version of events. But this isn't always accessible. It can be traumatic. It can be difficult to remember what to say and further we can get in trouble for interrupting when we want to share our experience. We need lunchtime structured activities such as drama, music, art, reading groups, which they can participate in when they're not coping in schoolyard or need time out from friends. We see that autistic girls have low self-esteem and they think that they're being excluded and it's because it's their fault. We need to help her understand that she's not doing anything wrong and that repetitive bullying or excluding behaviour is never her fault. We need to ensure that she has a safe person and a place, a teacher, principal, support staff or trusted friend she can access if she is being bullied. There's a lot more I can talk about this and we've spoken to, as I said, around this. So if you do want to look up our previous talks, please do so. I'm going to shift gears again and talk about flexible education because we want a national approach to providing more flexible options for education for autistic girls and gender diverse students. And homeschool is one of the options we see our community access. And whilst many parents choose this because it's right for them for a variety of reasons, we know that some of our families are forced into this option as a last resort to protect the interest of their child. There are many examples of children, particularly who have experienced rapid improvement in mental health because of this. We want to make sure that there's more support for this community. We want more flexible options. And during lockdown, Yellow Lead Bug surveyed our community on the experiences of remote learning and the submission based on 57 responses was that it highlighted a lack of specialised support for their child in the classroom. The experience put a spotlight on the extent on which the current education system is failing to provide flexibility, particularly those with hidden needs who are being disadvantaged both academically and in terms of their well-being and engagement. The survey also highlights that some autistic girls experience less social anxiety and sensory overwhelm in not having to deal with the classroom pressures. 
Some parents observed that they had been asking for a more flexible home-based approach to education for their child for many years, and it only took a pandemic to receive it. The remote learning experience has demonstrated that this type of schooling option is feasible and should be made available going forward. Remote and flexible learning has highlighted the fact that there is not a one-size-fits-all approach when it comes to supporting our students. It has confirmed the need for more flexible and individual needs-based approach. We need to do a lot better at understanding and supporting autistic girls and gender diverse individuals at school. And this commitment to action needs to occur at a national level. I'm nearly finished, so thank you for hanging in there with me. It needs to be consistent across all states. I know we do at Yellow Ladybugs a lot of work with the Department of Education in Victoria but we need buy-in from all states. If work is to be developed in this space on a national level, it is critical that autistic input is prioritised throughout the development of this strategy and that autistic-led organisations such as Yellow Ladybugs and many others like us have a seat at the table. This representation is needed to ensure that the principle of nothing about us without us lies at the heart and centre of any strategy developed and to ensure that the full diversity of autistic experiences, including marginalised groups such as autistic girls, women, the autistic LGBTIQI plus and is represented equally and BIPOC community. Equally critical is that autistic representation includes, sorry, I'm getting really tired and it's my last sentence, but okay. I will say that. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> equally critical is that the autistic representation continues into strategy implementation, including policy and program development and delivery. There's a lot of research about us, but we want more programs to support us. Our recommendation is to fund, involve and partner with organisations like Yellow Ladybugs to implement these changes. We need to see an education system so our community can reach their full attention. That is it for me. Thank you so much. I now want to introduce you to our <coughs> case study, Alexa, who is mother to Bridget. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Katie and Alexa. Are you ready? Yes. Ready? So, Commissioners, um, Alexa is going to tell you about her daughter, Bridget, and Alexa has looked at our terms of reference and wants to speak to the terms of reference on the topics of neglect, abuse and exploitation. So, Alexa has prepared some notes and, um, and together we'll work through the material and Alexa, if you need a break or a deep breath, just say and, um, and we'll take it slowly. So let's start, Alexa, you wanted to tell the Royal Commission about Bridget and uh, who she is, what she likes doing, and then we're going to talk about some of her experiences at school. So over to you. Thank you. Yes, about Bridget, I would say she has a hilarious sense of humour. Her number one goal most days is to meet people and talk about life. No topic, topics are off limits. During isolation of ongoing lockdowns, she taught herself how to play guitar. She's proud to be autistic and is intuitively a social justice warrior. Although sometimes delivery can be a bit like a sledgehammer, similar to myself. She loves school and always has. Even when things have been dark in the schooling arena, she would wake up excited to get to school. She's not far off 14 and still has not been granted her pen licence. The controversy on pen licences at mainstream schools has been a topic for us off and on over the years. The dogmatic approach of the system that you are only due a pen licence when you can satisfactorily use cursive writing. The pen licence crusaders will say, well, you don't get a driver's licence unless you can drive a car. So stop asking for a freebie. In our opinion, this is just another show of othering. On some days, we roll our eyes together and laugh. And on other days, she asks, why can't the system be kinder to those that learn and do differently? The system is, is telling her that she's different and that it's not good enough. Um, so 
that so is do you want to, so that so do you wanted to sort of to start on the first topic of neglect and you wanted to focus on systemic neglect based on some of the experiences that Bridget has had but also what you've observed generally so the first topic is the lack of options within public schooling system and needs not being met. What would yep. you like to tell the Royal Commissioners? So, yeah, I'll take you through, I guess, our journey, which is fairly long. But um, when we engaged with the education system and started touring schools uh, before PrEP, most schools in our region had about 60 to 80 PrEP students in one open plan area. We knew that this would escalate difficulties for our child in a noisy, overcrowded environment. We were always open with leadership when we were looking at schools um, about what supports we might need at the time. Transitions were tricky, sensory sensitivities, crowded, noisy places, and traditional reciprocal play with kids her own age. If she did become distressed, it could take a long time for her to recover and she may need adult support. During the recovery phase, she would often need reduced demands and expectations. So we picked a small independent school which offered small classes of about 12 kids and we were told that they had a more gentle approach to education. Part of the curriculum was a small daily meditation which at the time we discussed with our daughter and we agreed she might enjoy and we were focused on the small class sizes. I never thought in a million years this would be our path, an alternative type setting, um, as some of the alternative philosophies do not appeal to me, um, we, but we knew that we needed to try and find a smaller class for her. To be clear, we never wanted to change anything about her way of being. We only wanted to help her find a way of settling into the education system. Looking at the school, the public school options we had, despite being decent schools, it was terrifying. Our daughter was diagnosed as autistic in prep at age five and a half, although her behaviour was not so much internalised, so it was somewhat less difficult to have her assessed and diagnosed. Our paediatrician was very experienced and she suggested some equipment. Um, support offered at this independent school was almost non-existent after diagnosis. Uh, leadership really refused to engage regarding any disability supports. No formal policies and procedures, as far as I'm aware of, existed at this school. Hi we, we had our own private therapeutic support staff, but we were not allowed to bring them on site. There was no individual learning plan given. Honestly, I don't think they even knew what it was. Um, no meaningful accommodations for school mandated meditation sessions, which were five minutes in the morning and afternoon. Instead, we were advised by leadership <clears throat> um, that happiness leads to resilience and that my child must be very unhappy if she's unable to cope with the demands of school and she should meditate more. Advised by school wellness staff to purchase alternative medicines like massage oils for feet and to avoid eating hot foods to help settle down periods of dysregulation. She had started to form new friendships and we were hesitant to move her from the, from the school connections. Eventually, our daughter began to wet themselves before meditation, which had never been an issue before. Our psychologist spoke to the school and said um, that she should have a period of not joining, joining those meditations, which would have been an accommodation, obviously, and that was not allowed. She um, was allowed to do meditation at home for a period, but it was not to be ongoing. Her distress, distress continued to escalate. Uh, I'm asked to meet with the principal uh, and I said, if, if she cannot participate to your standard in that meditation, what does that mean? Um, and I asked, what do you normally do in this situation, given that she is autistic at means support? And they said they had never come across this before. Uh, they advised she could not attend the school if she could not complete the meditation to the required standard in class, in class silent as she liked to hum. Uh, Bridget says that uh, she would ask for extra support for various things and was told to stop being dramatic. Um, knowing that she was clearly distressed uh, at the end of term, we left the school and due to the quick transition, we went just to the local school in our zone. All right, so just pa pausing there. Yep. Uh, you're now going to talk about the first public school that mm -hmm. Bridget went to and you got to tell the Royal Commissioners that the support 
offered at the first public school was from your perspective and experience pretty poor and you had no funded support at that time. What would you like to tell the Royal Commissioners? Yeah, so uh, at the first public school, um, our daughter was quite dysregulated at school and was considered disruptive most days. Some accommodations were allowed, but no real understanding of how to support autistic students. Um, so often as a parent, you're in a, in a crisis, you're trying to manage your, your, your child within the, edu but then you're also educating you know, the teachers and the, the staff, and it, it, it's a lot. Um, so some accommodations were made regarding uniform and schoolyard. There was a retreat drawing area, but given her impulsivity, it was almost impossible for her to self-direct when she was overwhelmed. Um, we had no funding at that point. Uh, so moving schools also meant disrupting peer connections, uh, which leaves a student more, more vulnerable. She was allowed to attend the office for support, but that meant sitting in the hallway alone. The idea that break times are for social learning and should not involve any st staff support is outdated, in my opinion. It doesn't consider the complexities some students face, which can build into extreme anxiety and school phobias. Some allowances in class were allowed, such as movement breaks on occasion, but despite having the autism diagnosis and ADHD, there was no formal documentation in an ILP. They were open to trying an ILP, but I don't think they really knew what to put in it. So my eyes are a call. I don't think anything was ever signed off. Um, absconding from school began, hiding in the yard at bell time when breaks finished. Altercations in the playground increased. As kids learned, she would react. Punishment-based approaches to her behaviours. She had to write apology letters to other students. Um, that had sought her out and set her off, which is a common theme in our community. At one point, uh, she was taken to the grade five class when she was in grade one to apologise in front of the class. We were told the new teacher had a tough approach and was great with kids like Bridget. So treating autistic meltdowns and general behaviours as deliberately disobedient is what that means, basically. Uh, we left a week into the new year, knowing it would only decline with new class teacher. I mean, you've got to know when to call it, you know. Um, so one teacher said directly to my child, um, I, I don't know why you're changing schools. It's not going to help you change the school, suggesting that the behaviour was out of control and no fault of the school. We never said it was any fault of the school. The school tried to support her, but we could see it was simply beyond them. So, um, so you left that school, you then start a second public school with a specialist autism program. Yeah. And there were funded supports that improved over time. You felt welcomed by the leadership, but these programs turned out to be applied behaviour analysis, ABA, and that actually ended up escalating her distressed behaviours over time. Mm -hmm. So how old was Bridget at this time? Oh, about seven. Yeah, we, yeah, so we sort of did a year and a half at the first independent school, six months at the second school, and then, yeah, about grade two, so she would have been about seven, yeah. All right, so you want to talk to the Royal Commissioners about these therapies, and um, you've got quite a, a bit that you want to say on that, so I'll invite yeah. you to speak and read to your notes on this, this issue. Thank you, Thank you. Alexa. Uh, so, um, obviously, we, we did a ring around, we found this school, uh, we were told that um, the program supported autistic students, we didn't want her to not be in education, so we were lucky to get a place, off we went. Um, we knew nothing much about these programs at the outset. Um, in the end, for our child, this type of compliance-based therapy, the demand reward cycle, did not have any positive impact for Bridget and in fact became quite damaging and continued to compound school-based anxiety and her response to flee school. On two occasions, she was nearly hit by a bus at the front of the school where she'd escaped the school campus and was in flight mode with no ability to grasp the risk or danger when in that escalated state. Leadership eventually applied for severe behaviour disorder funding which was a gruelling process for Bridget, us as a family and the staff. 
often taking four members to complete paperwork over months, ensuring every little deficit was pinpointed and ranked in the hope we were lucky enough to secure funding. This type of funding is rarely granted. Um, I noted in G's evidence on, I think, Tuesday, they mentioned that these assessments are often dehumanising, and we would agree with that. The first application was rejected, and with uh, continued commitment from staff to reassess and list, seek to list more deficits and a reapplication, we had some funding approved at that point. In our state, an autistic student cannot access funding support under autism alone. There must also be either an intellectual disability, a severe language delay, or what is deemed to be severe behaviour disorder. The label itself is obviously horrendous. Um, this is an autistic child that just needs tailored supports. But at that point, you know, you're like, call it what you want. We just need support. Thank you for the funding. Um, so throughout school, we had various private therapies to help learn strategies for her to make sense of the world um, and the demands of life and school, including psychology, occupational therapy, speech pathologist, pedi and our pediatrician. Eventually, medications were trialled with specialist support through our regional mental health service CAMS. Although the build-up of increased demands at school, general trauma of not fitting in anywhere, and then the added new medications, resulted in a peak of absconding from home and school, extreme risk-taking behaviours, self-harming and suicidal ideation at age eight. This finally started to fatigue the school as well at this point. She's not learning anything here in her allocated six hours a week. That was all she could be on site at that point for over a year was six hours a week, two hours for three days. And I had to pick her up then. Um, uh, this all accumulated in, in my child becoming very unwell and ending up in a mental health crisis at age eight. CAMS were concerned about disassociation and we were admitted for a four week inpatient stay with one parent always be there on site. This was at the statewide inpatient unit at the, at the Austin for observation, medication review um, as well. The paediatric psychiatrist then discussed with us the relevance of pathological demand avoidance, which is recognised in some countries as a specific autism profile. Um, this helped to explain to us why compliance-based therapies, reward charts as a very basic form, would likely be very difficult for our child and may lead to escalated behaviours rather than a supportive measure. Instead, we should try to work collaboratively and offer options around demands. Our first night sleeping at CAMS, I emailed our local specialist school in the dark, sitting in the dark, and asked if there was a vacancy uh, when we were discharged from hospital. That happened fairly quickly, and we were accepted um, without, and without funding already in place by the previous leadership, we wouldn't have been accepted. We, I don't know what we would have done. Okay. So this is then the next school. Mm -hmm. Um, so Alexa, I've just got a reminder to slow down for our interpreters. Sorry. <laughs> so <there's, laughs> so um, now you've got the next step in Bridget's schooling journey and uh, she starts to attend a specialist school. So what would you tell the Royal Commission about the specialist school for Bridget? Um, so from the outset, I would say she would not have access to an education at all without this type of placement. Putting aside debates about segregated schools, if a child is going to miss out on education altogether, then there is a need for special schools, in my opinion. Knowing that the staff could help work through behaviours with her rather than sending her home, built trust that the school and the staff would not give up on her. This was her school and they would not ask her to leave. She found this incredible. She really did. Um, this was the first time that she spoke positively about her learning experience. Um, and it, it seemed to ignite a fire in her that she realised she was actually able to learn at that point. Um, albeit at that stage, she had missed out on years of learning. Um, 
When advocates say that segregated learning needs to be abolished, it's my opinion that they don't always consider those students that need the safety of a locked gate. I realise maybe that falls into restrictive practices, um, but gates are not allowed to be locked in a mainstream setting. And for us, my daughter explains it, that um, when you're fighting an invisible obsessive compulsive urges, sometimes to run for a variety of reasons, sometimes she needs the knowledge of knowing that they are secure with a locked gate. This is how my daughter describes it. Thank you, um, Alexa, for uh, talking us through the different schools that Bridget has been involved in. The next topic you want to talk about is sort of some features of the way in which education works for Bridget and what you've seen for other people as well. So can we move to the topic of reduced schooling hours during yeah. formative years, the prep to grade three results in ongoing learning disadvantage. So this is picking up on that theme that you've just spoken mm. about, about having missed out on years of learning. What would you like to tell the Royal Commissioners about that? Yeah. So I, I would just say that for, for all of her formative schooling years, she had restricted access to schooling, which escalated over, over time. And by grade two, she was only allowed to do six hours per week. And that went on for about a year, maybe longer. And the only schooling program for autistic students in mainstream school at that stage, I think, yeah, was ABA. I can be corrected on that, but I think that's right. Um, and which turned out to be quite detrimental for us and really compounded the feelings of uh, distress leading to that mental health crisis. Um, so in my opinion, ABA should be replaced with a more modern collaborative approach. Um, listening to the autistic community on this, both the children and adults that have been through the system should be central. And you wanted also to speak about funding for students who yep. are autistic but have an average language an average language score is limited. What does this mean in terms of uh, how they're assessed? Yeah, so I would just say, um, again, putting aside, I guess, the overarching debate about whether there should be specialist schools as part of the structure. Access to these schools is, is severely restricted anyway. So getting that funding, we were lucky that we had leadership that said we are going to stand by you and help you with this. Most schools, if you asked for severe behaviour disorder funding, would either say, what is that? Or they would laugh at you and say, there is no way you're going to get that funding. Um, the, the leadership that took it on for us knew the system and, and changed our lives, really, by... Uh, and knowing that potentially we were going to have to move if things weren't uh, going to work out at that second public school. Um, so for us, without specialist school setting, our child would not be have access to education due to the extreme risk taking in the mainstream setting. Katie's spoken about your conference for the last uh, few days and that very strong theme of trauma and the importance of a trauma-informed approach. And Alexa, this is a topic you wanted to talk about, is trauma relating to school exclusion, the lack of community and that sense of belonging mm -hmm. and self-harming at school. What would you like to tell the Royal Commissioners about the importance of a trauma-informed approach? Mm. Um, yes, so, I mean, I appreciate you know, staff are already under-resourced um, and, you know, the pandemic hasn't helped that. Um, so, you know, but as far as trauma-informed approach, understanding where the child is coming from and what they've been through, potentially feeding into whatever behaviours they're seeing, um, I think there needs to be some sort of training or, you know, higher understanding of what some of, the kids have been through um, and even if you know you don't know anyone's story basically you don't know what's going on um, and self-harming within the education setting is really a masking and a coping mechanism for a lot of a lot of people um, that a lot of kids that 
do self-harm. So telling a child to stop or to punish the behaviour with sending them home or the idea of suspension isn't going to have a positive impact. Driving this behaviour underground is more dangerous, in my opinion. Uh, encouraging open dialogue and support for the student is more important. I know it can be confronting for school staff and there needs to be proper training, um, potentially a mental health officer, or I'm, I'm not sure, but, um, but self-harming is a fairly significant issue for our community um, and it's distressing and people look the other way. They don't know what, really what to do as far as school yeah addressing it when it's happening at school um, is, is very very difficult for staff so um, treating this behavior as deliberate is a huge area of concern for us a distressed child is not deliberately trying to upset anyone and is not attention seeking um, understanding meltdowns and shutdowns and self-harming behaviors fall into the realm of having a panic attack and many students like Bridget end up in mental health crisis and self-harming can be an extreme form of self-regulation. Providing alternatives for her and ensuring the student knows they are supported and that they are not in trouble is important. All right. Thank you. So we now want to turn to the topic of abuse and some of the matters that you're going to talk about now are quite confronting. And you've, through Bridget's experience, uh, had a number of experiences that you look at as a form of abuse. Mm. The first one you want to speak about is the use of unreasonable restraint and the use of force in relation to children. What would you like to tell the Royal Commission? Yes, um, on well, on one occasion um, when uh, she was in a meltdown, two program staff, not, not teaching staff, not educators, um, but on site on campus, um, pushed my child to the ground and pinned her to the floor um, from behind to two adult staff members um, in an equipment room where she had been separated from other students um, and staff during a meltdown. During that incident, she was pushed face first to the ground and hit her head with some force. Um, enough for her to say that her face hurt the next day. Um, she was. This was reported to school leadership. So she told me. I told leadership. It was taken seriously and was dealt with swiftly. And to our satisfaction, um, in that instance, open and direct communication in the follow up was important to uh, to the situation. School leadership being accountable and not attempting to cover up anything. Um, and uh, not attempting to blame the child at all is a huge part of maintaining trust within the school setting, listening to the child involved, letting them know that they are believed and this is not acceptable and that it's not their fault at all. They should be safe at school. Um, staff dealt with it accordingly and school processes were improved to reduce the chances of a repeat issue. Um, but it's something that, you know, you, you don't, forget when you send your kid off to school every day. And I, it's, yeah, other reports within the community of similar things. It, it, unfortunately, it happens. The next topic you want to talk about is the experience of girls and sexual harassment by their male peers. What would yep. you like to tell the Royal Commission about sexual harassment? Yep. Um, so I would gender imbalance at some specialist schools, some, some autism specific schools have about 80% male enrolments. This is not accounting for any gender diversity within this cohort of students, which it should account for um, gender diversity, but it just sets the tone, 80% males in a, in, a, in a high school setting um, where their teenagers, um, the female or gender diverse students are often, well, are the minority and there might be one, one kid in the class and the rest is um, teenage boys. Sexual harassment with graphic sexualised language and objectification of females by male peers can form toxic French ideas of friendship and relationships and have lifelong effects. Um, <clears throat> and I would, yeah, this is one of our biggest concerns at the moment um, in the 
yeah, there'd be sexually explicit uh, and violent, sexually violent language used probably most days. Uh, yeah, I would say. Um, and it's just full on, to be honest. So she she loves going to school. It's the only option that we've got, that's for sure. We feel supported. But it is a fact of her day. that, um, And this can lead to episodes also of physical violence, um, whether if one of the older student, male students is having a meltdown themselves or challenging behaviours. Um, she, you know, she could be kicked or hit with a chair, um, those sorts of things. As much as it's contained, as much as it can be by the school, it can flare up. And again, it's something that's on her mind when she goes to school every day, um, she, that she's more vulnerable as a female student. Um, and after years of discussion and asking, I'm pleased to say that education programs around consent and healthy relationships has now begun at the school. Um, but yeah, um, I think yeah. you've said this is a really big concern as she's now almost 14 and mm -hmm. you're concerned as she becomes a young woman, how does she manage the sexual harassment at school and does she have the tools to yeah. be able to deal with that? Is that right? That's right. And to be clear, I mean, it, yeah, the language is pretty horrific. It's not, yeah. uh, I mean, yeah, I realise on any level it's, it's, it's obviously bad, but um, I don't want her to think that that is just acceptable, um, that, oh, well, that, you know, they didn't mean it. It needs to be mirrored by, obviously, the staff about not only is it not okay, but why the language is not okay, um, not just, you know, it's not just swearing, you know, um, it has a bigger impact on a, on a young, vulnerable teenage girl young woman um and yeah we're, it's a huge area of concern for us okay the next was punishment based responses to autistic behaviors and you've uh, you know addressed this as we've yeah. spoken through but there's yeah. one particular point you wanted to make here about public shaming yeah yeah i would just say um so I, I, often on over the years you know um if there's meltdowns shutdowns or skimming uh, when a child is trying to self-regulate, um, that their natural autistic behaviours whilst learning, um, that public shaming and punishment for those behaviours needs to change. Um, it's just so outdated. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I'd say it probably goes on in most schools. Um, but now's the time to, I think, really start to accept the broader community um, and how that may, may present if a child is nervous um, or worried about a certain thing or simply or happy skimming. Um, it, it's not hurting anyone. I don't, I don't know why it's, you know, stop, sit still, mm -hmm. hands to yourself, that sort of thing. All right, so the, the third topic is exploitation. And, uh, and I, can I just cover the topics that you've raised in that first paragraph, saying that often students do not have their needs met within the mainstream schooling system and are pushed to consider other schooling options, including Catholic schools, private schools, and other independent schools. Regulation of these schools is somewhat less than the public mainstream schools from your personal experience. And this can open up a vulnerable group of families and students to exploitation on various levels. This can be damaging but it is often built on the fear of the child being excluded from school entirely. And you wanted to make some recommendations based on your reflections of Bridget's schooling journey so far, yep. concerns about her into the future. And what would you like to tell the Royal Commissioners about your recommendations? Yeah, um, so I just think there needs to be a consideration of more flexible options in delivering education to this cohort of students and also um, around the curriculum and actually just in general um, if you look at our community tells us there's a future schools alliance which is a couple of schools that I know of um, offer generally more flexible you know less demands 
um, less expectations, uh, more interest-based programs, whether that be animals or sewing or what, whatever it is that the child children might be into, um, that helps engage children um, with their learning if it's special interest-based. Um, I realise, you know, you know, maybe that can't be done um, at every school, but there should be an increase. If the feedback is those schools are working, um, then I don't understand why I guess there's not more of those schools. Um, and, you know, the way that my child learns, uh, I've been into the classroom during education week a week or so ago, it's six desks, six large desks in a, one classroom and, you know, the teacher's close up, there's no clutter, there's no noise, there's no... Um, there's not too many people. I don't know how you can how you can create that environment in a, in a in the current mainstream setting. So if you're to remove specialist schools where this is the schooling that the child is getting, then I don't know. Do you look to other? They have other classrooms, but then it's still segregated. It's still them and us. Um, those classrooms. Um, so I don't. I don't know what the answer is, um, but I, it's the other thing also is the schoolyard um, in a mainstream setting. Um, my daughter describes the schoolyard as just unbearable to navigate. So, her, just, so yep. jumping in, in there, just take, take you down to uh, you often speak to Bridget about how she feels going to school and beyond. What has she told you? Yes. Um, well, she is resolute that um, she would not feel safe anywhere but a specialist school, that, that they're her words, but that she hopes uh, there will be more options available to students in the future. Currently, there are limited options to socialise outside of class with peers. Community-based excursions help, but this is not building long-term friendships or support networks. Engaging with Yellow Ladybugs has helped to fill this need building ongoing confidence, support and positive friendships, regardless of school changes. Yellow Ladybugs has helped um, always be a supportive environment that welcomes differences and helps to build a positive autistic identity. This is literally the only group or activity that has helped our child to build and maintain peer connections and a sense of value in the community setting throughout the turmoil of school changes. She also just began going to minus 18 events, which supports LGBTQIA plus young people. And this is her first experience of a supportive, successful socialising in a non-segregated setting where she is immersed in the general minus 18 community and not only her autistic peers. We do have concerns for her wellbeing once formal school ends. As G has described in their evidence, it was like falling off a cliff. I can see that this could be the case for many young people that are somewhat cocooned in the specialist setting. Our child sees school as everything, uh, most form of social connections and routine. G mentioned how important it is that young people hang out together, the community of young people in all their diversity, sometimes across school settings. Dual enrolments between schools are generally discouraged due to mixed routines and having to split funding. And in my opinion, this limits community exposure for students in the specialist setting where they could build peer connections rather than just having off-site excursions in the curriculum. Thank you, Alexa. And Bridget's um, done a drawing that she wanted to contribute as part of this hearing. But before we show the drawing to the commissioners, Katie, can I come back to you? And you've prepared some slides for the Royal Commission which reflect some comments from your members. Do you want to tell the Royal Commissioners about the slides and yeah, then we'll play the slides? And thank you, Alexa. Um, we asked our community this year to send us student, current students and past students what message they wanted to send to the community regarding their education and what the profound messages back was the internalised and hidden experiences and the profound impact it's having and had on their life. And it's very moving and powerful. And I hope that 
everyone can share it because every teacher, parent or anyone in a decision-making setting needs to watch it. So thank you. I wish my teacher knew. Directly from autistic girls, women and gender diverse students, past and present. I wish my teacher knew how good I am at masking. I wish my teacher knew that I was trying so hard it hurt. I wish my teacher knew that just because I'm quiet and well behaved, that doesn't mean I'm okay and not dying on the inside. I wish my teacher knew how much I was struggling and that their quiet ducks were secretly drowning. I wish my teacher knew how unsafe school was for me and how much more I could have achieved if I had felt safe. I wish my teacher knew that I don't always know what's wrong and how long it will be until I'm ready. I wish you could show a visual demonstration because when you verbally tell me what to do, it makes no sense. I wish my teacher knew I take longer than others to learn new skills. Please be patient with me. I don't work well under pressure. That every sound and movement was an assault on my senses and sent me spinning into fight, flight, shutdown. I couldn't learn in that environment. I wish my teacher knew that I didn't get the handbook. I felt and said and did everything in chaos. And when you told me nobody loved me, I believed you. When I'm being chatty and disruptive, it's because I'm distracted and dysregulated. Not because I'm a mischief maker, attention seeking or intentionally naughty. I wish my teacher knew I was being who I thought she wanted me to be. I wish my teacher knew I had no friends. I wish my teacher knew how lonely I was. I had no friends. I wish my teacher knew how much energy it takes just to show up. I wish my teacher knew that I know the right answer, but sometimes my brain doesn't cooperate with my mouth. I wish my teacher knew just because I'm quiet, I have an IQ of 138 and I read very well, I still struggle to complete assignments after eight hours in school. I wish my teacher knew that when she made me stand in a corner until I explained why I was rude, I had no idea what I had said that was wrong. Then I got a desk round the corner from everyone behind a filing cabinet for the rest of the year for my crimes. I wish my teacher knew that my struggle to speak or make eye contact was more than just shyness. I wish my teacher knew that I was autistic. Isolating me from my peers would not force me in her box. I wish my teacher knew that bullying a little kid would create a lifelong trauma. I internalised the shame about my inability to self-regulate and be more in front of my peers. It wasn't a choice. I wish my teacher knew I was happy sitting alone during class time and I actually learnt better this way. I wish my teachers knew I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm trying to survive in a world built against me. I wish my teachers knew that I can't fix my slow processing or writing speed with practice. I wish my teacher knew how hard it was for me to stand in front of the whole class to answer questions or do presentations. I wish my teacher knew I needed real life connection to the learning. I wish my teacher knew that punishing me makes me feel worse about myself. I wish my teacher knew how desperately I wanted to be chosen for things. My arm ached from stretching my hand up so high. I wish my teacher knew that me not speaking didn't mean that I had nothing to say. I wish my teacher knew I want to, but sometimes I just can't. I'm not deliberately trying to disobey you. 
I wish my teacher knew that I took the hall duty job to stay inside and away from social situations. I wish my teacher knew that everyone thinks I'm annoying. I wish my teacher knew how much her support not only changed my life, but saved it. I wish my teacher knew that she was my only friend and I will always remember her. Thank you to all the wonderful teachers who make a positive difference in our lives. Thank you, Katie, for those slides. And I think the last words go to Bridget. And Bridget has prepared the following drawing for the Royal Commission. And so I'll just put that up and, um, and I'll read. So you can see on the drawing, Bridget's drawn a heart with two sides. This side represents all of the anger I had built up, all of the things I didn't know about myself. On the other side, you'll see it's friendship, a love heart, music, I assume that's a yellow ladybug. Yes. And a teddy. This side represents all the things I have gained from the school I go to now and yellow ladybugs, all of the friends I've made and all of the things I've learned about myself. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you, Alexa. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Katie. I know you've had a very big week and I'm just going to ask the commissioners if they've got any further questions they'd like to ask you. Yes, thank you, Katie. And uh, thank you, Alexa. I'll just ask uh, Commissioner Galbally, who's in Melbourne, whether she has any questions for you. Thank you both very much um, for that uh, evidence. Um, no, I have no questions. Thank you so much. Commissioner Mason. Uh, yes, uh, I'd also like to thank you, uh, Katie and Alexa, um, and also Bridget for um, just a, a, a pow powerful evidence today. Um, that slide, um, is it going to be made available? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, it's currently on our socials and on YouTube because, like I said, we'd like every single person that can to watch it. Yeah, thank you so much. No questions, Chair. Uh, thank you, Katie. Thank you, uh, Alexa. And thank you, Alexa, particularly for telling us about Bridget and for allowing us to see Bridget's artwork. And that uh, slide show, uh, is, uh, as uh, Commissioner Mason said, is very powerful. The, the children who contributed to that, where did, they, where did they come from? So the people who contributed that are all from our community. So we've got a strong reach online and our members. So it's either past students who access yellow ladybugs or current students. Yes, well, thank you so much. And uh, I think like uh, uh, Commissioner Mason and Commissioner Galbally, we would certainly encourage you to distribute that as widely as you can. Thank you so much for giving thank evidence you. today. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, that takes us now to uh, an earlier lunch adjournment than we've had on previous days. So if we could adjourn now, and return at 1.15? One 1.15, one, one yep. Thank you. Thank you. We'll adjourn until 1.15. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all your support. Yep. Thank you. The Royal Commission is now adjourned. Silence, please. The 
Royal Commission is now resumed. <sighs> yes, where are we? Just let me get myself organised again and then I can go. Okay, yes, Miss Belton. Thank you, Chair. Commissioners, the next witness will be Mr. Peter Donatris, Strategic Advisor, Early Childhood Intervention and Autism National Disability Insurance Agency. Mr. Donatris, thank you for coming to the Royal Commission today to uh, give evidence. We appreciate your attendance, your assistance, including the statement that you have provided. If you'll be good enough to follow the instructions of my associate, she will administer the affirmation to you. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you, Mr. Donatris. Now, um, Ms. Dowson will ask you some questions. Mr. Donatris, you have prepared a statement for the purposes of this Royal Commission. Yes. And that's dated the 31st of May, 2022. Yes. And also a corrigendum to that statement dated the 6th of June, 2022. Yes. Have you had an opportunity to read your statement in preparation for yes. giving evidence today? And are there any corrections, alterations or additions you'd like to make? No. Um, commissioners, you'll find Mr. Denatra's statement at uh, Tend up bundle F tab one and the corrigendum at tab one A. Now, in introducing you, Mr. Denatris, I gave you a title as Strategic Advisor, Early Childhood Intervention and Autism, and you've been in that position since January 2017. Correct. And uh, is it fair to say in summary that your background is in early childhood intervention? Yes. Right. Um, you, you seem to hesitate there. Is there something you'd I, like to add? I have a broad background in, in disability that would cover what I would call the earlier years through to sort of the, the sort of early adult years. Yes. You would have you been following this hearing? Yes, I have. And so you would have heard uh, Ms. Eastman in opening on Monday talk about the the three themes that we, in particular, wish to examine with, in your evidence today. Yes. So I'm going to um, leap straight into the first issue, if if that's convenient for the commissioners, and that is that the question of what constitutes a reasonable and necessary support. Now. You've said in your statement that the NDIA's functions are governed by the National Disability Insurance Scheme Act. That's correct? That's correct. And also by rules made under that act. That's correct. And those functions include delivering the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Correct. And if I just call it NDIS, you'll know what I mean? Yes, I will. And part of the functions of delivering the NDIS include um, deciding what supports will be in a statement of participant support. Correct. And the statutory requirements around that decision are set out in section 34 of the, the relevant act. That's correct. And they include in paragraph F, you have to consider whether the support is most appropriately funded or provided by the NDIS and is not more appropriately funded or provided by another system as part of a universal obligation or in accordance with reasonable adjustments required under a law dealing with disability discrimination. That's correct. And there are particular rules, the National Disability Insurance Scheme Support for Participants rules, which deal with this concept of the assessment and determination of what supports will be funded. Yes. And you've also mentioned in your statement, and we heard reference in some evidence earlier this week, to the APTOS, the Applied Principle and Tables of Support. 
Yes. Could you please explain to the Commission what Aptos is in summary? In summary, the Aptos serves the purpose of explaining to um, all relevant parties what is funded or considered as the responsibility of a mainstream service and what and how that would interface with reasonable and necessary supports. It does that by stating the types of types of outcomes or the types of inputs that would be required. And it's enshrined in principles that talk very strongly to uh, the concepts of collaboration, both at a system and at a practice level. And so there are six general principles in Aptos, and then there are 11 specific service areas. Is that a correct way to understand it? That's correct, yeah. And those service areas include early childhood development. Yes. School education. Yes. And higher education and vocational education and training. Yes. Vet. Yes. And within those 11 principal, those 11 specific service areas, there are the tables provide indicative roles for the NDIS yes. and for other parties. Yes. And so in the in relation to education, the other party would be the school education system. Correct. The, the state or territory body. Yes. And consistent with the statutory test that we spoke about earlier, these tables make reference to reasonable and necessary supports being things that are additional to reasonable adjustments required under disability legislation. Yes, they are, they are described in a way to move the, remove the barriers, if you like, for that young person in the learning environment beyond reasonable adjustment. We asked you some questions uh, which you responded to in providing your statement about training for decision makers. And we didn't specifically ask about training on the reasonable and necessary support decision. But as I understand it, that, that process is covered in what you've described as the planning essentials training. Correct. And there are also uh, targeted training modules practice guidance, operational guidelines, and relevant legislation that would guide the reasonable and necessary supports decision-making. Yes. Can you, are you able to explain to the Royal Commission how, in summary, that training addresses reasonable adjustments required under a law dealing with disability discrimination? What decision makers are told about what is a reasonable adjustment? With all of the guidance material as, as outlined in my statement, decision makers or delegates as we call them receive guidance around individual circumstance that is consistent with the aptos and the principles of reasonable and necessary as outlined in the rules and section 34. They are supported to do that in the context of a person's goals and, and the discussions they would have with the participant and the participant's family in the context of how that would support the goals, taking into, my, taking into account what is the role of, in this case, education versus what is the role of reasonable and necessary in that. You did mention in footnote two in your statement, um, you, you cited the disability standards for education as the source of the definition for a reasonable adjustment. Do you, you see yes. that in your statement? Yes, yes. You, you also, sorry, I should have dealt with this earlier. You indicate in paragraph seven of your statement that it was prepared with assistance of lawyers and officers in the NDIA. Can I just ask how much of the statement did you prepare and how much was prepared for you? Um, I was fully involved in the preparation of it. There was drafting that would have been done for me and I would have read through that, checked it for its accuracy and my understanding of it being, um, it being a representative of my understanding of it. 
Why did you select the disability standards for education as the source of the definition of reasonable adjustment? The disability standards enshrine um, enshrine the, all, all of the aspects that you would consider as reasonable adjustment as a starting point, and you would consider them as a base doc, a base guidance to start to go to. You didn't cite the Disability Discrimination Act definition? No, I didn't. Is there a reason for that? No, there's no reason for it. Um, I felt the Disability Discrimination Act um, was, was assumed, so it may be a shortcoming. Yes. And is it the same true of state and territory discrimination legislation? Yes. And the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, which refers to reasonable accommodation rather than reasonable adjustment. adjustment. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the, the training that we spoke of a little earlier, the, the planning essentials training, delegates who undertake that training, are they trained in the disability standards for education? They are made aware of the standards and that, does that include being made aware of that definition of reasonable adjustment? Uh, I would imagine so, but I would need to check, yes. In your answers to questions four and five, which you've addressed in the statement, um, beginning on page eight at paragraph 34, you were asked a series of questions about the nature and extent of um, funding provided to an NDIS participant attending early childhood education and care, referred to as ECEC, primary school, secondary school, special schools, or SSPs. You can see that there? Yes. And just for the record, SSP schools for specific purposes. Is that correct? Correct. Now, I'd like to just, if I could, direct your attention to paragraph 45 and just um, step through briefly what it is that NDIS does fund, doesn't fund, or may fund. And so we see in paragraph, in fact, the heading to paragraph 45 is specialist yes. school transport. Yes. Uh, now, the question that you were responding to was about um, traveling to and from school. Yes. So just to be clear, it's the transport that's specialist, not the school that's specialist in this answer. Is that correct? That's correct. And you say in 45 that the NDIS may fund specialist school transport. And you mentioned this again in paragraph 62. If I can just jump to the end, I will come back to the bit in the middle. And you, you mentioned it here in the context of in-kind support. Yes. And as I understand this paragraph, in-kind support is something that the state provides that would otherwise be funded by the NDIS. Correct. And so the NDIS pays the state for this service. It doesn't come out of a, an individual participant's budget. No. Did you have an opportunity to hear the evidence of Mary Sayers on Wednesday? Yes, I did. And you may recall that uh, Ms. Sayers referred to perverse incentives for segregated schools, and she gave transport as an example. Do you recall that? I do. And what she said was that education jurisdictions will pay for transport to special schools, but not to mainstream schools. And if the NDI NDIS doesn't fund the transport, you're left in a situation where if you go to a special school, you get transport. If you go to a mainstream school, you don't. Is, is that correct, that if you are an NDIS participant who goes to a mainstream school, you don't get funded for transport, or are there circumstances in which you may? There are circumstances in which you may. And are you able to provide generally what those circumstances would be? 
Yes, where, where school transport um, is required that isn't in kind, that would be considered on a case by case basis. There are instances of reasonable and necessary decision making where the in kind arrangements don't cover emerging new arrangements. And, and those, in those instances, the delegate would consider the circumstances of that individual and their, the, the choice they've made in schooling. And how is it that the delegate becomes aware of what is provided in kind? Is the, the parent of the participant applicant to tell you that? Do you get it from the state? Where does the information come from? No, the information would come from the family themselves. Yeah. I don't quite understand the significance of in kind in this context. Uh, are you suggesting that there are in kind arrangements, for example, uh, with uh, Western Australia that uh, enable uh, the state to provide funding for transport to mainstream schools and that in turn the, for that the state get compensation from the Commonwealth? Is that what you're talking about? Yes, Chair, the, the in-kind arrangements were put in place in recognition that... Yeah, no, no, I understand the notion of in-kind arrangements. I'm just trying to work out why there's something special about in-kind arrangements as far as transport to mainstream schools is concerned. I think they're historical anomalies rather than any, any, specif any specified difference in, in why they would or they wouldn't. Yeah, can, can we take a step back and can you explain to me at least how it works as far as in-kind arrangements for transport to mainstream schools. In which states does this operate, for example? It operates in all states, Chair, um, but there are individual cases where the, the arrangements may not um, be, uh, be sufficient or, or, or cover the, the, the unique circumstances of an individual. They were, they were historical uh, funding methodology rather than a contemporary one. Yeah, I'm, maybe I'm slow today, uh, but I'm still not clear. With in-kind arrangements operating in all states, do, is, are those arrange, do those arrangements provide transport for all children with disability going to mainstream schools? For some, is it a matter for the state to determine? How, how does this work? It, it would be in all instances, you would hope. But so there's some, some instances where it has become apparent that the, the, the transport is unique to that family circumstance. I'm still trying to work out whether children with disability who go to mainstream schools, let's say in New South Wales, will they be paid to tra be transported from home to school? And if so, um, what are the criteria for that entitlement to arise? Um, if you don't know, I, I, I have to take that on notice. And, yeah. um, mm. It's oh, very, re very rare. What's rare? The, 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 the in-kind arrangement wouldn't cover the transport to school. That doesn't appear to be what we've heard, but uh, maybe Ms. Dowsett's about to clarify. I, I wondered, Chair, if perhaps uh, you and Mr. Denatris were um, speaking at cross purposes and perhaps Mr Natras correct me if I'm wrong but you're referring to state governments providing transport to school and the that does include mainstream schools but the issue is whether there is specialist transport school. so if, if the child can the child with disability can get on the bus, bus. then there's no specialist transport but it, it's the, the specialist transport as I understood Ms. Sayers' evidence, she was saying, well, the states provide that to special schools or segregated schools, schools, but they yeah. don't provide specialist transport to mainstream schools. And that was what the chair, as I understood, he was asking you yeah. about, but you were answering a different question. Christian. Very good. That clarified. Thank yes. you. That is correct. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> we're all on common ground. Yeah. So back to your statement, if I can, paragraph 46, you've indicated NDIS does not provide funding for uniforms. It may provide funding for personal care supports, 
And this is another of those arrangements we see in paragraph 62, which is an in-kind support. Correct. And so again, like the transport example, it's provided by the state, so through the school. Yes. It doesn't come out of the participants' funding. It's stated as an in-kind arrangement within the plan. Yes. And but the, the participant doesn't need to effectively pay for it. It's noted in the plan. Yes. The participant has no choice over who provides that in-kind support. No. It's just whoever's providing it at the school. It's an arrangement that's made with the school. Right. And if the participant or their parent has any issues in respect of that, the NDIA says, please take those up with the school, at least at first instance. At first instance, yes. And after that, who would they take that issue up with? If, if they were dissatisfied or had some some level of concern the ndia would support them to raise that up through the educational systems mechanisms um, we may provide additional support to do that whether it be through support coordination or local area coordination um, and in some instances they may be they may be um, assisted to access advocacy on behalf of their child and in relation to their in relation to their concern. Are there any circumstances of which you are aware that where a participant could exercise choice and control over who is providing their personal care at school? Not to my knowledge. So back to the statement, paragraph 48, the NDIS does not provide funding for modification to school curriculum. That's correct. It doesn't provide funding for excursions and activities outside of school. That's correct. If you were somebody who was receiving NDIS funding for specialist school transport, so leave aside the in-kind examples, but you were one of those examples of getting NDIS funding for specialist school transport, could that be used for education? Oh, sorry, excursions. Uh, sorry, could you ask the question again? So if you are a person, a participant, who receives NDIS funding for specialist school transport, could that funding also cover school excursions, transport to the excursion? Yes. So although you've written here that you do not fund school excursions within school hours, there may be exceptions to that. Yes. Um, NDIS doesn't fund additional coaching and homework. No. It doesn't fund school fees. No. It may fund aid, aids and equipment at the school. Yes, if it's personalised. Right. And you've added in, or you've stated in paragraph 53, um, hearing aids, wheelchairs, personal communication devices. Yes. And so that would include things like iPads that may be needed for communication. Correct. And the cost of apps to use on the iPad. Correct. Um, NDIS doesn't provide funding for after school or before school care. Paragraph 55. Yes. But you can have planned funding for capacity building exercise, capacity building activities outside of school hours. That's right. And you note that that may be used instead of before or after school. Okay. Okay. Yep. Now, in respect of the next paragraph, paragraph 57, which is participation in school sport and physical activity, you state that it is the responsibility of the education system to make reasonable adjustments in this area. Do we take it from that paragraph that the, the short answer is NDIS does not fund these activities? Correct. Now, moving then to work experience, you've stated that um, it, it's the responsibility of school curriculum to provide it. Yes. But if the participant needs extra support to do the work experience, that can be funded. That's right. Could that extra support be transport to the work experience site? Yes. 
because we heard from um, Ms McAlpine on Wednesday, she, she spoke about the reasons why work experience, I think she referenced in particular grade 10 work experience, sometimes fails. And she, she gave two reasons. She said an inability to organise one-on-one -on -one support and the transport issue of getting there. So I'd just like to have a, a little bit of a focus on those. The, sure. the transport, you're saying that can be provided. Yes, if it's reasonable and necessary and, and it provides it provides for the work experience, that is a barrier to being able to access the curriculum and, and that would be considered a reasonable and necessary from a point of view that that would be a type of transport that is stopping um, the educational experience. And what about the provision of one-on-one -on -one support for the student during that work experience period? Let's say it's a week, the teacher has got maybe 20 children in their class who are all doing work experience in various places. The teacher can't be getting around all 20 of them to provide the support that they might provide when the 20 are in the classroom. You'd accept that's fair? Yes. And so in that circumstance, could it be a reasonable and necessary support for the work experience person, to student participating in work experience, to be provided with one-on-one -on -one support for that week of work experience? If that one-on-one -on -one support was due to the functional impact of their permanent impairment and was a blockage to them accessing the curriculum, it could be considered. Yes. It could be considered. Yes. And Presumably the participant or their family would need to provide some kind of evidence to support this request. Yes. And that, that may be to say, to provide why it is that the, the functional impairment exists. Yes. And if they were able to do that, then there would be no legislative impediment to the plan including that funding. That's right, yes. Moving on to school-based traineeships, paragraph 60. The NDIS will not provide funding for supports that are the responsibility of the employer, the school or the traineeship provider. That's correct? That's correct. And you, you do say that if there are extra disability related supports, they may be provided. Yes. And so similarly to what we've just discussed so in relation to work experience, experience. Yes. if there's a need there, it, it may be able to be met. Yes, the reasonable and necessary consideration is in the, in the context of the impact of that person's impairment. And we'll come back to, to this idea of, of work experience and um, work exploration in, in a bit, but I just want to finish off this list. So paragraph 61, um, you refer to, well, you were asked about training for teachers and you refer in your answer to the APTOS and it outlines that other parties are responsible for the provision, for providing general support resources, training and awareness building for teachers and support staff. But again, the fund may include that if there's some uh, aid or equipment that the teacher needs training in. Yes. And so if there's the iPad we spoke about earlier that's been provided and there's the communication app that the child is using, could the plan include funding to teach the teacher how to support the participant using that? Yes. And then we finish off with in-kind supports and the, the two are the exam two examples you cite are the ones we've already spoken about, personal care in schools and specialist school transport. In his evidence yesterday, Mr. Percival appeared to indicate that there is some provision of um, therapy, allied health professionals, speech therapists and the like in Western Australia that that he, he seemed to be describing as an in-kind support. So it's something provided by the school, but really he was saying it was an NDIS responsibility. Did you hear that evidence? I did. And are you able to comment on that? Is, is that correct that in Western Australia, they provide in-kind allied health support on behalf of the NDIS? Look, I, I couldn't comment on it's, it. It's not, I'm not aware of it and it would be highly unusual. Yes.
I want to move now to the second topic and direct your attention to paragraph 29 of your statement. And you say in paragraph 29, the NDIS and the school education system work closely together at the local level to plan and coordinate streamlined services for individuals requiring both school education and disability services, recognising that both inputs may be required at the same time or that there is a need to ensure a smooth transition from one to the other or across service systems. I'd like to ask you, how does the NDIS do that? What do you do? The NDIS, um, so that's taken directly out of the APTOS. Yes, uh, I recognised it. Yes. And the NDIS um, is in its best practice guidance and in its, and its, its construct seeks to work with other systems as a team around that individual. When you're providing capacity building supports through, through therapies or, or, or other types of services that are developmental, it's important that those strategies are consistent across all parts of the young person's life and that those specialists are working as a team around that individual. The NDIS promotes that as its best practice and its preferred model. It works um, with other systems to ensure that that collaboration wherever possible is reached. It also recognises that within the interface with the school system there are some limitations because of the autonomy of schools. Um, Families in those instances um, are supported through support coordination or local area coordination to, to um, make those services as streamlined as possible so that they collaborate. You might recall Ms Langcake's evidence when she described Mitch's experience as being in a silo where school didn't connect to other parts of his life but she said the experience of Mitch's younger sibling is different. There's collaboration and teamwork. And she spoke about everyone being on the bus. Is, is that an example of what you hope best practice would achieve, the everyone on the bus? The premise, uh, the, the NDI would support the premise of Miss Landcake's, the underlying premise of Miss Landcake's um, evidence. When collaboration is reached to a level where everyone, as she put it, is on the same bus, consistency in in the young person's learning environment along with all other environments at home in recreation whatever it may be would would be optimized and that's quite clear in the evidence and research around what works um, best for young people with additional needs in his evidence yesterday mr percival spoke about spoke positively about the idea of allied health professionals being involved in the transition conversation, so in particular in enrolment conversations. But, and he observed that it, it's a great opportunity, but it might occur, it's less likely to occur in the NDIS context because of the financial impost. Do you recall that evidence? Yes, I do. In the planning decision, can funding be allocated for the allied health professional to attend those kinds of transition meetings? so that the parent is not faced with a choice between an hour of therapy and an hour of being in the meeting, that the meeting is separately provided for? Yes, it can. Although we would, we would express that in a plan in the terms of goals, and those goals would identify that, that a, a, transition, um, a transition was to be supported. Um, whether it was explicitly outlined that one hour of direct therapy versus one hour of, of transition meetings, um, it, it's, it's more expressed as capacity building supports. In the implementation of that plan, though, the guide, guidance the NDIA would give through, through uh, plan implementation would indicate that that is better practice that, and it's encouraged that that type of activity take place. So if a, a, a participant's plan included a speech pathologies, would it be common to see that expressed as a number of hours per week of therapy or a, a total number of? A total number, yes. Right. And so 
would would you see a separate entry somewhere whether in a goal or in the, the funding part of the plan that had that total number of hours and a total number of meetings or non face to face interact um, so not not therapy with the child but attending these meetings. The more detailed plan would be the plan that the provider or the speech therapist would have with the with the family and and that would be expressed in that if that that was the uh, if that was the sort of um, agreed approach um, in her evidence mary sayers said the ndis has no overarching policy that will encourage participants to pursue inclusive education firstly do you agree that that's accurate that there is no policy to encourage participants to pursue inclusive inclusive education. No, I do not agree with that. Sorry. Are, are you agreeing or are you disagreeing? You said no. There's no overarching policy. No, there's no overarching policy as I understand it. There's there's a lot there's a lot of direction about inclusiveness and about encouraging NDIS participants to uh, be part of mainstream services wherever possible. And that's certainly um, enshrined in the Convention of the Rights and the Act. The Conventions of the Rights so of the people, Act. No, Convention of the Rights and the Act. Oh, and the yes. Act, yes. thank you. Noting that the NDIS Act objectives include supporting the independence and social and economic participation of people with disability, do you think it would be appropriate to have such an overarching policy? Uh, yes, we, 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 the, the agency's policy role is, is focused on implementing the Act and policy would be considered in relation to operational guidance and um, more broadly the, the implementation of the NDIS to reach its objectives where we would, where we would look at operational policy that would assist that type of outcome, uh, and certainly, uh, you know, the formation of that in a more public way would would be useful. Yes. Do the operational guidelines speak to the inclusive education goal? Yes. Yes. The NDIS collects a lot of outcome data. That's correct. Yes. And it collects outcome data in relation to school or education goals. Uh, yes. And does that data differentiate between mainstream education, mainstream schools and segregated settings? Um, I would need to check, but I think it does. I'd, I'd need to check. That's yeah. okay. You can take that one on sure, notice. Yeah. Uh, what sort of outcomes are you referring to, Ms. Dowsett? Well, uh, so, if the outcomes of students having a goal around school or education. So yes. whether it's to, to be, do, do the goals differentiate between being in school or being in a particular school setting? Um, I don't think they had that le level of granularity. I'd, I'd, again, I'd need to check. Yeah. And do they have in relation to the, the goals, does it go beyond attending? The, the, so, so sorry, perhaps I'll, I'll, rather than guess what the outcome data you collect, what outcome data do you know that is collected in respect of schools or education goals? So schools and education goals would be that they have the choice of the schooling um, environment that they, they are after, that they are able to attend school and participate at a level that's satisfactory to them. And so when you, you say that um, they are able to have the environment thereafter, it is there that you're perhaps, you're not sure, but maybe the granularity no, is in yes, there. Yes, yes. I want to turn now to the transition. And I want to ask specifically about the transition from school to life after school. Yes. We did ask you in the notice to talk about the transition into school and out of school, and you, you have addressed both, but just want to focus on transition to life after school. You would have heard G Brown's evidence where they described their experience as 
being pushed off the edge of a cliff that um, the school, G said, kept promising sessions about transition, but they didn't happen. You recall that evidence? Yes, I do. And G also spoke about their siblings' experience, saying that there's next to no discussion from the school, from the NDIS, or from anyone about the next stages of support. You recall that evidence? I do, yes. Were you surprised by that evidence, that there's no, no conversation from the NDIS about the next stages of support? Um, no, no, I wasn't surprised. You wouldn't expect the NDIS to be? No, I would expect, but I know that it hasn't been a strength of the NDIS thus far, and we're addressing that issue. Mm. Now, I have... Sorry, how, how are you addressing it? Now, the, the NDIA has, has, um, has developed a, a post-school um, strategy where um, it was identified through some of the trials that we did early in the NDIS that this was an area that was of great concern, transition to post, po the post-school um, was not optimal for many, many students with disability. While the NDIA recognised that schools had a role in, in that, we felt that um, the evidence was clear that additional support was required, that it needed to start earlier, that it needed to be more, um, need to be better supported and more focused to give uh, young people with disability leaving school real options in the post school environment. Therefore, we have looked at a comprehensive strategy uh, upon um, going out on broad consultation with people with disabilities and their families themselves, um, with service providers, with sector leaders, with peak organisations to design um, an investment strategy that would encourage um, school leavers to have a better planned tr transition a more thoughtful transition and one that is more on their terms rather than what the system was currently affording them. Yes. Is that a strategy in writing? Yes, it is. This is a strategy to develop a, a proposal or plan? It, it's a strategy that, that invests um, at, at various levels in, in um, focusing on developing the individual plan uh, through our LACs, through our planners, through earlier engagement through the school system with uh, students with disability, and to work with the post-school environment to um, develop service offerings that were of use to that individual. It also follows the, the, the research and evidence um, that was viewed that that is a highly individualised um, choice people with disability need to move at their pace rather than some system imposed pace and that that investment needs to be highly individualised for them to be able to choose real options in the context of their life. Given the structure of the NDIS and individual plans which form the core mm -hmm. of uh, the support that is provided to uh, participants, how does the NDIS bring or the NDIA bring this about other than by drawing the attention of participants and their families to opportunities for funding of uh, particular strategies to facilitate the transition? The NDIA is, is, is currently now very actively engaged with all school systems to, to raise awareness of, of this, this type of opportunity. It, it is investing further in um, further in uh, it, its training of its own staff. The the uh, investment in disability disability employment champions and uh, and general uh, awareness raising through the planning process of of how important this transition planning is on the individual level for our participants. But ultimately, it's up to the participants and their families to take advantage of this by seeking funding through their plans. Um, yes, that's correct. Jim. That's correct. Yeah. Mm. 
Is that strategy that you've just been referring to what you reference in paragraph 84 of your statement where you talked about um, finalising an improved model of support for school leavers? Yes, that's correct. And it will be in place for this year's school leavers, you've said? That's correct. Is there a document that, uh, I think you answered this for the chair, there is a, a written strategy? There's a strategy, a written strategy under development. Um, there is uh, there is internal uh, documents and, and artefacts that have been developed to get this implemented, but uh, a more wholesome strategy for publication is yet to take place. Yeah. And have you developed a, a system or a mechanism by which you'll be able to assess whether this new strategy succeeds in addressing the deficiencies that your consultation identified for you? How do you know it's working? Yes, we're looking at a, a, an evaluation framework for this. This will include the collection specifically of outcomes data, of information from participants on their experience of, the, of this type of approach. We're looking at um, quite purposefully constructed provider information and reports back on progress, and certainly longer term, a full evaluation of, of the success or otherwise uh, opportunities for improvement in this type of approach. You also spoke to the chair about um, working with schools to provide information. Uh, I ask that uh, your attention be drawn to a couple of documents that were produced by South Australia. Did you have an opportunity to, to look at those documents? They're yes. tabs, uh, commissioners in volume D, tab seven and tab 21. So Mr Donatris, uh, the document at tab seven is a one page flyer branded for the NDIS. And then it says SANT Pathways to Post School Life, a session for students in years 10 to 12. Do you have a copy of that to hand or you've had a an opportunity? I've had, a, I've had a chance to view the document, yes. And it says the National Disability Insurance Agency would like to invite SANT students with a disability in years 10 to 12, their parents, carers and education professionals to attend a virtual information session on building skills and paving, paving a pathway to post school life. Is, is this a new program? Yes. It's not a it's not a program, it's a strategy. Yes, we don't we don't fund programs. But, yeah. This is a new strategy. This is part of the work you were referring to yes. with the chair before. Yes. Is this the first year that it's been offered? It's it has been trialed in a number of states pre COVID and this is the this is the improved strategy that we consulted on. And is the improved strategy offered in all states and territories? Yes, it is. And we see from this document that information sessions are held monthly from the 20th of April 2022 to the 29th of September 2022. That is for South Australia Northern Territory. Is the same time frame applicable to every other state and territory? Yes, it is. How did you select years 10 to 12 as being the target for this strategy? The feedback in the consultation um, clearly indicated from the trial of this type of approach um, that waiting to year 12 was too late, that that, that that was not suitable to everyone and that the earliest um, we the NDIS could engage would improve um, the capacity of our participants and families to plan longer term. I think the second the second point within that was that many families expressed that if they started to think about um, post school life earlier, they could do e extra activities outside the school environment that would include volunteering, work placements, part time jobs, all which were proxies and indicators of work post school for all children. It's not just children with disability. There's a lot of research that shows if a young person has a part time job, they go on to uh, employment. So there was those types of considerations and feedback. 
And starting at year 10, Ms McAlpine in her evidence suggested that it, this kind of pathway conversation should happen in year nine, because by year 10, year 11 and 12, you're making subject choices and making decisions that affect your pathway so that the planning needs to start before you start making those decisions. Firstly, did you hear that evidence? Yes, I did. And um, so the NDIA has selected year 10 as the starting point. Are you able to tell us why it was year 10? Taking into account everything you've already said about starting early is good. Yes. Look, year 10, year 10 was the, the consistency in the feedback across all of the school systems and views of many of the stakeholders. Um, nothing precludes um, a family starting earlier. Nothing, nothing stops them from having vocational or, or in some form of other goals in their plans earlier for exploring their strengths and, and their likes and dislikes in this area. Many of our local area coordinators, services um, who, who assist in the planning process may see individual cases where it will start earlier, year nine. So it could just be a session for young people and the people who support them without the years 10 to 12 in there. Yes, it could be. The document at tab 21 is, it, it appears to be a copy of a presentation and it is largely NDIS branded, though this one has some South Australian specific information inside. Is there a, an equivalent for every other state and territory? Yes, there is. And are you able to provide those to us? Are they something the NDIA has? Um, yes, we would have them. They're prepared in conjunction with our community engagement and education counterpart, uh, counterpart uh, uh, project teams. So I'm sure we could ask each eight state and territory if they put specific information in them to provide that. So the the branding on the front of this one refers to the co-design and engagement team. Is that an NDIA team? Yes. In this document at page 15, it talks about, the, the slide talks about preparing for post-school life and capacity building and makes the point that you made about preparation being the key and then it goes on to describe the supports, NDIS supports available while in school. And then on through the, the South Australian state specific, so I won't read those out. And then post school options. And it is in post school options that we see a reference to work experience, specifically under the heading to get and keep a job you could NDIS can help with funding for work experience on the job support supports and employment or capacity building to manage in a work setting. Noting what you said earlier about the school based work experience and the support that could be available there and your answer about part time jobs, are we correct to understand that the NDIS can fund for a participant who is still in school some employment exploring supports like work experience before they finish school yes that's correct and so they can do that that test and try different work activities while they're at school yes it's not limited to like SLES funding after they've finished school no they can express through their capacity building um, funding uh, a broad range of extra activities while still at school, which could include part time work, volunteer work or exploring um, their strengths and, and likes and dislikes. Ms. Dowsett, how are we going for time? I have three questions left here. Good, as long as they're nice, short questions. I can only speak for the questions. I'm sure the answers will be equally brief. In her evidence, Isabella spoke about the support coordinator and she described the coordinator as being able to point her to agencies or support providers, but she said it was still up to her to, to make the contact and to talk about 
Emerson and to do what she described as trial and error in terms of finding a support provider. You recall that evidence? Yes, I do. Is that description of the support coordinator's role consistent with the NDIA expert expectation? Support coordination has clear um, guidance. Some organisations do it better than others. Um, the, the, the expectations would be set by the family that were requesting the type of support. I would expect that support coordinators would play an introductory role as per the, as per the sort of guidance. Um, the trialling and erroring, as I understood it there, was for her to then go and, and, and find which one sort of suited her son or daughter the best, yes. Does the NDIA have any oversight of relationships that might exist between support coordinators and the providers they recommend to, to make sure there's an appropriate degree of separation? Do we regularly monitor conflict of interest and those sorts of things? No. I think it's, it's, it's assumed in the ethics and standards of, of practice that, that declared conflicts of interest would be disclosed at the time of giving of that advice. And my final question, Chair. In her evidence, Ms McAlpine spoke about gaps in transition planning and she proposed that perhaps the NDIA could do an internal assessment of the risk of a person going into segregated work or activity settings and then provide information to that participant and their families about mainstream options. Do you see a role for the NDIA in that kind of process? I think promotion of the, the options for that individual should very much be explored, particularly in the pre-planning phase where where the individual be, would be working with the infrastructure of the NDIS. Um, our local area coordinators would, would and should have more aspirational um, conversations, but that's individualised. Um, I, I would say that the NDIS needs to uphold its, its um, commitment to, to, to the Act and the objects of the Act, where we would be encouraging and providing information to our participants of possibilities um, beyond um, just the segregated options. So I think it would be a, you know, it, it would be a lost opportunity if we didn't explore that on a case by case basis. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Those are my questions. Very good, thank you. Fortified by Ms Dowsett's splendid example of uh, limiting herself to three questions, do the commissioners have equally brief and limited questions? First, Commissioner Galbally. Yes, very brief, thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you about the early childhood um, approach, in particular in relationship to rural and remote, the tailored program you're developing and also to the hardship and vulnerable groups that are in your new strategy? Yes. Um, it, it's recognised that early childhood intervention is very important in many rural and remote areas and for disadvantaged areas, engagement early is not um, a strong feature of the current system. The tailored strategies and approaches are about um, meeting families and, and children where they're at, rather than trying to get them to access services that don't exist. Um, the early intervention also is predicated on engagement in a positive way where the child and family don't have to, don't have to wait for, um, wait for not only being made um, made eligible for access to those services uh, and then being passed onto a service system. In rural and remote areas and in some communities, it's been identified that if those things were to happen 
holistically and naturally without starts and restarts, it would be an advantage. So those, those types of strategies are being explored. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Mason. Yeah, no, thank you. Oh, Commissioner Mason, you're doing very well. <laughs> In that case, uh, now I'll just check whether the Council for the Commonwealth has any questions. Yes. Very good, thank you. Mr. Donatris, thank you very much for coming to the uh, Commission and giving your evidence, which uh, has been uh, very uh, helpful to us. We appreciate your assistance. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. East. Okay, yes, Ms. Eastman. Ms. Eastman, I think there'll be some directions, will there? There will. Um, yes. They've just appeared. So, Commissioner I'll Frank? just check if they're the same ones as I've already got. No well, difference. that concludes the evidence for yes. public hearing 24. And we've provided you with some directions. We've consulted with all of the parties with leave to appear. And I think there's broad and general agreement on the directions. I'm not quite sure what you've just been provided. I think I've been given with larger type. It's very considerate. <laughs> uh, may I then proceed to make the directions on the basis that they've been provided to all the uh, parties who've been given leave to appear. I'll read the directions and unless there is any objection to any of them, uh, they are the directions that can be taken as having been made. One, any witness who took questions on notice during this hearing should provide his or her answers in writing to the Office of the Solicitor Assisting the Royal Commission by 24 June 2022. The answers should be targeted and concise and not address additional or unnecessary matters. By 1 July 2022, Council Assisting the Royal Commission will provide a list of documents she wishes to tender into evidence, including responses to questions on notice, on a confidential basis to the parties with leave to appear at this hearing. Parties with leave to appear should advise the Office of the Solicitor Assisting by 8 July 2022 if they wish to suggest any additional documents for tendering by Council Assisting. At the same time, they should identify any parts of those documents that they consider need to be redacted before the documents are made public. Four, Council Assisting will tender those documents into evidence which she considers appropriate and will do so in chambers by 15 July 2022. Five, Council Assisting the Royal Commission will prepare written submissions following the hearing by 19 August 2022, these submissions will be provided on a confidential basis to parties with leave to appear in preparation for this hearing. Six, any responses to council assisting submission should be sent to the Office of the Solicitor Assisting by 23 September 2022. Those responses should be concise and should not include any additional evidence. So on the basis that uh, no uh, party has any objections to those directions, they are the directions that will be made, are made. I should indicate uh, that uh, for this public hearing, uh, as I have just uh, indicated through the directions, there will be submissions prepared by council assisting, but it is not proposed to produce a commissioner's report for this hearing. Council assisting submissions uh, will be taken into account, of course, in the preparation of the final re report, and also, of course, any responses to council assisting submissions by uh, parties who've been given leave to appear at the hearing. Thank you, Chair. Ms. Eastman, is there anything else that you wish to say? Uh, no, only on behalf of the council assisting and the office of the assist solicitor assisting the Royal Commission, just to thank um, our colleagues who have represented their witnesses during the course of the week, and also to thank all of the witnesses who appeared at the hearing. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Ms Eastman. Um, I would like to add uh, my thanks, of course, to Council Assisting the Royal Commission, all parties who have been represented here today, uh, and their representatives, 
all of the staff who have contributed to the preparation for and conduct of this uh, hearing and all others who have done so, for, for example, Law and Order. We have a number of parties outside the Royal Commission who assist uh, with the conduct uh, of the uh, hearing. As I indicated at, uh, in the opening, these are extraordinarily difficult and complex hearings to organise and to conduct, and it is a great tribute to all those who have been involved uh, that this hearing, like so many of the hearings we have held uh, for the Royal Commission, have proceeded so uh, smoothly, and we are very grateful to all those who have contributed. I would like to express also the thanks uh, of uh, the commissioners who have been participating in the hearing to all those who have given evidence, particularly the students with disability from whom we heard and their families. We heard uh, from uh, Brittany Wilson, Britt, who gave evidence about her own experiences and the experiences of her younger sibling. Britt's evidence highlighted the aspirations of many students with disability to be supported without fanfare so that they can participate in school alongside their peers and feel as though they are part of uh, the school community. We heard from uh, Ms Lancake, Kimberly Lancake, who gave evidence about her son Mitch and the significance of collaboration and a team approach in supporting a child or young person with disability during transitional periods and throughout the child's school life. In her own words, as we heard uh, just now, it's important uh, to get everyone on the bus and to ensure that uh, there is a collaborative process between the school and the family and that all people involved in the child's learning and development can share information and expertise. And in this way, the burden on parents of children and young people with disabilities seeking support for their children can be reduced. We heard from uh, G Brown, who gave evidence about their personal experiences in school, as well as evidence about uh, their younger siblings' experiences in school. G's evidence emphasised the significance of school to the life of a child or young person with disability, not just in terms of academic development, but also social and mental health, life skills and the routine of everyday living. Uh, G said that uh, insufficient support throughout their school life meant that leaving school felt, in her language, like being pushed off the edge of a cliff. I had no idea what my next step was meant to be. G's evidence was very powerful. We also heard very powerful evidence from Mr. Ed Croft. Mr. Croft is a teacher himself and clearly is dedicated to his profession. He gave evidence about his son, Ryan, and the severe impact on Ryan's life caused by insufficient supports and by um, teaching staff who did not necessarily understand his needs. Mr. Croft felt that Ryan did best when provided with supports that he needed, when his, and in particular when his behaviour was treated as a normal expression of his self, and the support system around Ryan worked as a collaborative team focusing on Ryan's needs and preferences. Ryan's present position is very difficult, as we heard, but uh, the commissioners very much hope that it can be improved in the near future. We heard uh, from Baz. Baz told us about his experience as a young person with cerebral palsy who uses assistive technology with a considerable degree of skill to participate in school, in his words, just like everybody else. And he showed his ability to use the assistive technology in this hearing room. He reinforced the message that we heard from many young people with disability that their key aspiration is to enjoy school and life alongside their peers. One might have thought, what a terribly difficult aspiration to meet. Now, Baz, we were told, has an aspiration of, is it 500 followers in his, on his Facebook page? And one of our council has dedicated herself to uh, attempt to reach this goal. I don't know whether we've quite reached it. Well, or, or whether Baz has reached it more accurately, but I hope he can get to the 500. We heard from Baz's mother, Dr. Julie, her evidence related to her vision of schools, and uh, she saw education authorities as proactively preparing for a diverse cohort of students, ensuring that, that schools, curricula, and other activities are universally designed, 
rather than being tweaked at the edges each time that a student with disability enrolls or seeks to enroll at a school. She expressed her views very clearly and forcefully about her vision for inclusive education. Isabella gave evidence about her son Emerson, who's currently in year 10. Isabella told about the challenges that she experienced trying to obtain support for Emerson in mainstream schools. Once Emerson began receiving the support he needed in school, particularly in the form of consistent communication support, and Emerson's teachers saw him through the lens of his strengths and not his deficits, he made significant educational and development uh, achievements. Uh, we heard today from uh, Yellow Ladybugs, Katie and uh, Alexa, uh, and uh, uh, Alexa uh, told us about uh, her daughter, Bridget, and each of them uh, gave us uh, their experience and their views about education for children and young people with autism. And of course, we saw the uh, slides that uh, incorporated uh, the uh, feelings of uh, students with disability in uh, schools. We have also heard from representatives of uh, Western Australia, South Australia and the National Disability Insurance Agency. We are very grateful to them for their contributions to the hearing. Uh, so I again express on behalf of the commissioners our deep gratitude, particularly to the students with disability and to their families and to their um, uh, supporters uh, for the contributions they've made to uh, this uh, hearing. I think uh, it's very clear that the material we receive during the course of this hearing will be exceedingly helpful for us in preparing our final report and formulating recommendations on uh, education for children and young people with disability. I am told that Baz now has 353 YouTube channel subscribers. His channel, for those who are interested, is Baz Tech Oz. You've got only 47 to go. Thank you very much, everybody. Ms. Eastman, is there? Um, may I also thank uh, CIDA and Inclusion Australia for the contribution of Ms. Sayers and Ms. McCallum? Yes, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned Ms. Sayers and Ms. McCallum. I thank the, uh, Ms. Uh, McAlpine. Hmm? McAlpine, I'm sorry. Uh, I express our gratitude to both of them for the evidence that uh, they gave, and I echo uh, the thanks that have been expressed. Uh, by Ms. Easton, Eastman to CIDA for assisting in uh, uh, providing witnesses to us who have enriched uh, this uh, hearing. So our thanks to them very much. Thank you very much. We'll adjourn. Um, our next hearing is 11th of July in uh, Alice Springs, which uh, happens to be Commissioner Mason's hometown. We'll adjourn until then. The Royal Commission is now adjourned.